Oof. All right. Making mistakes left and right here. Welcome to another live stream. It's been a few weeks. Uh, what has happened? I went to Germany. We did live streaming after that. We got back. And then, uh, then I got sick. I think that's what happened. Yeah, I got sick. So, got the COVID. That took a week or two. And then, yeah. I'm a little worried. I'm not seeing any pictures show up yet. Maybe you guys are just hearing voice with no picture, but you should be. All right, it looks like it's working now. Uh, so yeah, I got sick with COVID, so I've got a little bit of phlegm stuff going on. wasn't wasn't too crazy. Uh, then my I gave it to my wife, so I spent two weeks kind of just not doing a whole lot. And then I did an event where we went to a small local fish store, the fish store or the fish room in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, yeah, it was a good time. A lot of people showed up, lost my voice, Katie lost her voice, and uh, yeah, so now, that was last weekend, here we are, and I released that video on Friday about Gigazoo. If you haven't watched yet, that there's very few videos that I really kind of geek out on and really think are super duper special, and this is one of those. The last time I think I was this geeked on a video was when I was in Israel looking at robots feeding the fish farm. So, uh, this video came out and it did absolutely terrible. So I went out of my way to promote it. We changed the title and the thumbnail and everything. And I learned, you know, the store was amazing while I was filming it. And this all ties into why I love small fish stores, by the way. Uh, but it was amazing while filming it. And then like, I got the after story. Now, uh, Franz is the name. I think F R A N Z was his name. He doesn't speak English very well. He can understand a little bit, but he doesn't speak it very well. So I had Chris translating for me the whole time. And so we went out to dinner afterwards. He took us to an amazing uh, dinner there in town. And I had schnitzel, which was, oh my gosh, mind-blowingly good. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the story about Gigazoo. And I'm also going to tell the story about uh, the fish room. But what I love about small fish stores is when you find one where they're really pouring their heart and soul into it, it becomes a body of work. And what I mean by that is, for many years, for me, my store was all I did. I wake up, think about the store, I go to work, I make the store better, I go home, I do taxes and other things, work on the store, order stuff, make it better, and I'm in that cycle for years on end, right? And someone like, like Franz has done that for 25 years. And so I love seeing someone really put everything they've got into something. And for the fish world, I can really appreciate that. One, because I've done it a bit. But then two, it's the hobby that I love. And so I think other people really appreciate it too. When you see, you know, we kind of look at maybe a corporation, maybe the big box stores, and we go, why aren't they doing amazing things? They have all the money. They have thousands of staff throughout the country. They have all these resources, and they're not doing it. And then you see basically this homegrown backyard basement, garage, starting thing becomes something so great because, you know, one or two people have a vision and a drive to bring it there. Now, not every small store gets to that level. There's a lot that, you know, maybe get diverted uh, from their main goal. But when you see one that's just really giving it their all, it is something that I, I really just go, wow, this, this is something to aspire to be, whether I owned a fish store or not. And you'll see it in other you know, maybe you see a really good mom and pop restaurant. You go there and you feel good when you, you pay money and you eat the food and, and all of the things. And I think that's what we get from these mom and pop fish stores is you go there, you give them their, your money, and you see the money get reinvested back into the, to the space and make it better for the next time you come. And so when you, you, know, when you buy that Neon Tetra, you pay the employees' wages, you're doing all of these things, and that's a very rewarding thing for me and my hobby as opposed to buying from a chain store. I don't have anything really against chain stores. I just don't get the extra warm fuzzies. Like, I can go to a, a Subway and get a sandwich. And truth be told, I don't really like Subway. But you could get a sandwich there. But finding a mom-and-pop sandwich shop where they kind of they build it with that love and like, hey, what, what, what sauce are you putting on there? That's pretty good. What are you doing? What? Oh, I got this, this for cheese? Options? All right. And so I think that's the difference between a mom-and-pop store and like chain stores. And they don't have to be giant chain stores. I've seen it where 
uh, you know, a mom and pop, they get bigger. Now they've got four or five stores and they lose that mom and pop feel, in my opinion, because it's not just dedicated, make the one thing better each day, little by little by little by little till eventually you've made something amazing. So I want to tell the story of, of Franz because it was, I heard this while eating dinner and he was buying us dinner. He would not let us pay. He was very, very kind and generous man. He had this giant dopey dog. He took us to our house, his house first. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit too. And so he's explaining like, well, you know, why, why this pet store in Bavaria, you know, what, what led you to this kind of thing? Like the store is amazing. Cause I was asking like, why, why, why carbon fiber aquariums? Why make everything? Why use granite? Why, why, why? And so he told the story and the story started, well, his story actually goes back 25 years. He was living under a bridge. He was homeless. He had nothing. Uh, you know, I, I, I get the vibe that maybe he was having, you know, a little bit of, you know, some mental anguish, you know, I don't know what that's from and pry into that, but he's living under a bridge and eventually he decides I've got to do something with my life. Um, you know, one way or another, whether he's going to end it or not. And he had decided he wanted to own a pet store or a fish store in, in particular. And so while living under a bridge, he applied and got a small business loan for a small amount of money from the government and was able to build this empire. And he put everything into it. He slept at the store. He, he got the lease and he just, he, he built everything because he had so little money that he just had to. And that carried on forever through this thing. And so as he was opening a store and he was starting to sell some fish and all of that, he eventually was making some income and he put 99% of it back into the store and he's living there. And then he eventually can buy the land that it's on and he buys the land and he starts building a home behind it and his home behind it is built by hand by him. It's made out of rocks. He would go get rocks and cement and all the interior walls, all the exterior walls, everything is rock because it was the cheapest thing he could build with. And so he built, it's weird to see like, you don't build wood cabinets for your sink. It's built out of rock and cement. And then he had all these big wooden timbers and everything that he would, he would basically get and then work them. And then he would build that into his thing. So his home is crazy unique, just like a store. And everything is, is hand built. Like, you know, I don't live my life that way. You can't go, well, how'd you make that thing? Like, oh, I ordered on Amazon. I put it together. He'll have a story about where he found the wood, what tools he used, what were the challenges, why he built it that way, and all of that. And so I found it to be incredibly amazing. And none of that went in the video, by the way, because I didn't learn any of that till after. And I didn't want to necessarily taint the video or anything. And so when it the video came out, it was doing poorly. I was really sad because I knew there was this absolutely amazing story to go along with what I thought was an absolutely amazing store. So I thought the store was mind-blowingly cool before I even knew the backstory. Like when you hear the backstory, now you're like, because there are comments, right? Comments, there are people leaving comments like, this person must come from money, no way you could afford that. And here I do, here I know the story of like, didn't come from money, came from living under a bridge. And he literally you know, that mom and pop feel of, I sold six neon tetras, so I bought six neon tetras, bought myself a little bit of food, and took the other three dollars and put it towards the next thing of the business. And I, I resonate with that because many years I was eating top ramen behind, rest in peace, the Murphy tank. You'd sit on a stool, I had a microwave, and I'd just be eating top ramen, listening for the door, and go, oh, I gotta go. Then you come back to very cold top ramen, you kind of warm it up again and uh, not healthy for you. You don't look forward to it, but you can afford it and you want, you know, sure. Could I eat a $20 meal? Yes, but I can take the $19. And for me back then, it was literally, I can buy two more bottles of prime. So now I have four on the shelf instead of two, cause I was running out and you keep doing that over and over and over. And, and now we're at a scale where we still do that. I have, you know, I have payroll and I have all of that, but it still is, if we can build up the money, we put it into the next product. Can you know? And a lot of the development we're doing, it it actually revolves around, can we afford to do it? Uh, not so much, 
figuring it out. We've got stuff that's ready, but can we afford to place the order? So, yeah, so I thought amazing story, amazing, uh, just amazing store. I, I hope more people will go there. I hope more people will highlight it. Danny's Aquarium's here. I hope he makes a trip. It's, you know, probably a couple day drive for him. This The city was old and cool, and and uh, as you guys saw, you just see the mountains in it. And we kept driving, and I was like, there's a really cool store here. And, and where it actually comes from, the, the story actually starts, I met him at Interzoo. And he came up to me, and he knew I was on YouTube, and he didn't speak a whole lot of English. But he came to me personally, handed me his card, and he said, I think you'd like it. You should come out to my store someday. And I said, I will. And so I, I really try hard to follow up anytime I agree to something. Mostly I'm a guy now that I've learned say no all the time. But when you say yes, I feel like you have to try. And so I went to Germany a couple of times. It didn't make sense in the schedule. That's way out of the way. And then this time it did make sense. And so I went and boy, was I glad. And I got to show you guys this guy's life's work. And he's he's still working on it. That's the crazy part is w before we got there, he's like, as I showed in the video, like he's redoing sections, he's making it better, he comes up with better ideas, and it's only going to get better with age, and I just find that to be amazing. It was very inspirational. I, I definitely was like, I wonder where I would have been had I not, you know, gone to YouTube and online and just really fixated on the store. Could have went out of business, could have made it better, I don't know. It's inspiring, no doubt. So, yeah. So if you haven't watched that video, I highly recommend you watch that video just to see what could be accomplished by essentially one person with a vision whether it applies to your hobby or not doesn't matter it just is really cool to see it actually play out if you speak german you can go to chris lukup's channel which i saw he was in the chat here and uh i don't know if he's put it out yet but he's got he actually did a whole long interview with him about the store as well so got a lot more details but it's in german so you'd have to speak german uh yeah so and then I want to talk about another store because I went to the fish store in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, uh, you know, I met Dustin and his partner and it was and his, his parents were flew in to help with the event. And uh, other people donated time to be there for this event. A lot of people came through. It was great. And Dustin got a lot of inspiration from my store. Always flattering, right? Like that. But again... It wasn't until the event was over and we were at dinner. And I don't know why. I guess I guess by the time you spent, you know, you spend hours with people, then you kind of you kind of know you you warm up to each other. And you know, he had said, like, you know, someday I gotta tell you the the story. Cause I was supposed to film a, a video when I got there, but they were still kind of getting ready for the event. And he's like, Someday I gotta tell you the story of how I started this. And I was like, Well, sh tell me now. We're sitting next to each other eating dinner. And he said, Well, you know, I'll, I'll send you some pictures and some stuff down the road. And, and But the, the basic was, so the reason we were there is he had expanded the store, which is always a great milestone for any local mom and pop fish store. And they were in a very small thing that he'd bootstrapped. He had made enough money to now move across the parking lot to a bigger space. And the space looks great. Check out the pictures online. I think we posted them on Facebook and I think YouTube. So... But the way it started was he started during COVID. He took his two stimulus checks and he put that money into the first lease on the small space. That's all the money he had. Everything was, he, he worked as a landscaper uh, before that. Didn't have really much money. Took the two things, basically rented a space, bought some two by fours and some cinder blocks and said, I'm going to be a fish store. And what was interesting, that whole time that we were meeting and greeting with fans and taking pictures, and they were so blown away, one, we'd come out to New Mexico, and then two, they always had a comment about Dustin and the store about he really deserves it because he's working so hard to build the store. And then people were saying, I like that when I spend my money here, I can see that it makes the store better. So when I come in next time, the store is even better for me. And I kept saying, yeah, that's that's the dream, right? The dream is you spend your money with someone and then next time you come in, your experience is even better. Like that's the ultimate commerce, I think. And so I felt that story was very cool too, which I hadn't known. Like Dustin's been a great supporter of the Aquarium Co-op products and he sells a lot of them and he does a great job at the store. And so it's, it's cool to see that 
by us helping the RPP programs, he's been able to thrive. We did the event that also, you know, biggest sales day he's ever had. So that feels good. And to just see all that kind of playing out and seeing why we we invest in this RPP program. There's definitely some where we see long term should be financially beneficial. But in the short term, we've actually watched sales come down for us um, because people are buying locally. And so basically, when you buy locally, you uh, you support that local store and then they support us. So instead of us getting the full money, we get less. Right. But we do think long term that will prop the hobby up and we do have bigger goals than just, you know, make profit number go up. Can we change the industry? Can we do some of these things? And, you know, we've been asked thousands of times, why don't you franchise Aquarium Co-op? And one, I don't think we can franchise this type of stuff. I think it's uh, you have to you have to want to do it. You have to be that I'm going to put everything I have into this fish store to make a great fish store. And when you franchise, typically it's how much profit can I make from this intellectual property? And that's a very different pathway where when we sell products to these local fish stores like this, they still have the all in mentality because it's their money, their risk, their blood, sweat, and tears. And there's been plenty of tears in my own store. You know, I've almost gone out of business a couple of times. There's just been roadblocks. There's, there's always stress in business. Um, you see it wherever you work, you see it in other small businesses, you see it in family members where they work. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a very good relationship we have going with these partner stores. I'm very passionate about it and seeing it, you know, kind of visiting the stores and seeing the people see it makes sense. They're enjoying it, knowing that we can support in some way helps, especially when you know like they were bootstrapped from the beginning of like, yeah, a couple of stimulus checks. That's it. You know, I was lucky to start with $50,000 from my silent partner. Even that's a very small budget compared to, you know, what some of the chain stores and stuff are doing. But, uh, you know, I had clearly a leg up and I had a lot of expertise from running a store, but that, that money still doesn't go very far. And as, as you learn, when you own a store, you're just, Oh, geez, I didn't expect this. I didn't expect that. Who knew water heaters were so expensive? Who knew screws were so expensive? Who knew, you know, when you've got a bank account that's got nothing in it, everything seems real expensive. So, uh, yeah, that's that's why I love small fish stores. Is a true small fish store, they're giving it all they've got, or they're not, and they're going out of business, right? So you 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 only get those two pretty much. You get getting better every day, or dying a little more every day and won't exist. You know, and and when you meet someone like uh, Ocean Aquarium in San Francisco, that's another life's work. And, uh, you know, very interesting, very cool. Love that store. Love the owners. Fascinating. I I love that. I don't love when you you see stores go out of business. Like, that's not great because that was someone's dream that has failed. Um, But usually you can kind of look in and, and, you know, 10% of the time there's something they couldn't control and that caused them to go out of business. But 90% of the time... Well, there were some bad decisions and, and some other stuff that went on and, and, you know, maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe there wasn't the training. Maybe, you know, the planning was wrong. Who knows? You know, maybe they weren't in it all the way. Sometimes people get into aquatics because they're like, hey, it's lucrative. And they find out working with livestock, you know, it's like being a farmer or something like that where it's like, yeah, you make money kind of, but at insane amounts of work and they're still like, what do you mean it didn't rain forever? What do you mean a tornado came through here? What do you mean, you know, this illness hurt my crop or my fish or this or all my employees quit or whatever? So, yeah, small fish stores are amazing. Uh, and I think they're to be cherished and people should should uh, do what you can to support them. I'm not saying donate all your money. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying if you already need a diesel green, go buy it there. Or if you needed a fish, buy it there. It's a dollar more there and it's been quarantined, but the chain store has it for a dollar less maybe, right? Do what you can to uh, support the local stores and by and large, they'll do what they can to support you. They might not right now. Maybe you're into African cichlids. You can still buy your African cichlid food there and maybe in five years, they've built up a big enough store that they now uh, stock African cichlids for you. So I think as as I age, and I think a lot of people age, we find that, that the more you invest in your local community, the better your local community gets for you. Um, and if you're not moving around all the time, it makes sense. Invest where you live and then uh, 
have a better fish store, have a better hobby, have a better club, have somewhere to unload your fish. Uh, a lot of the fish there, you know, were bred by someone local, so that was cool to see. They had adopted our tag system. If it was bred locally, it was in blue. And so I really like seeing some of these ideas spread out throughout the country. Imagine if you knew, if you walk into any local fish store, maybe even the world, if the tag is blue, it's been locally bred. Like that's just an amazing thing. Like everyone would just know, right? Uh, just kind of like we know, like, uh, you know, pink ribbon is what, like cancer awareness or cancer type uh, stuff. We could do that in our own local communities of the fish hobby. And so that's where, you know, it's like the easy aquarium LED. It's concepts like that that I'm trying to rattle around in my little brain going, can we get a bigger thing going? It doesn't make any one person extra money, but it makes the hobby better, which if the hobby is always getting better, the whole industry is growing. So every mom and pop, every chain store, every Tetra, Eheim, giant corporation, every aquarium co-op just does better. And every hobbyist goes, hey, products are better. They're more available. I've got more places to shop. I've got more places to sell or trade my fish. I've got more people to interact with. There's more clubs, all of it. So yeah, that's my, my small fish store love story. And, uh, you know, it's a little biased, obviously. I started out as a, a little fish store. We're, we're still a little fish store. I mean, when you compare our, what we do in commerce compared to so many of the the flu walls, the Tetras and that kind of stuff, or the bulk resupplies and other, like we, we're this David and Goliath type stuff, you know, we're, we're tiny in comparison, but you know, same thing. If you compare a fish store that's been open for a year to us, like now we're the Goliath and they're, um, you know, so, you know, we're just in a big transition and hopefully, you know, we've been in business for about 11 years. Where will we be in, in 14 years? Is it the best retail store ever? Is it more retail stores? Is it we're working and really trying to change the hobby? Is it we're doubling down and getting clubs started up? You know, that's another idea I've got of like, at some point, how do we want to get more clubs started and support more clubs and, and offer resources to maybe struggling clubs? Even if it's just like, here's a blueprint of how to do it. Here, Here's what we recommend and here's what we've seen work. And that's what we were working on for RPP stores too, is collecting data and when people ask questions, we go, well, here's the anonymous data we have. Let us help you. Maybe here's how much of this you should buy. Or other stores your size are doing this on Wednesdays. How come you're not? All of that kind of stuff. So, all right. I always watch the replay. Best customer service on the plant. I almost wore that shirt today, but instead I wore my new fish scale shirt, which I am absolutely loving because it's all fish scales. All right, let me let me dive into the chat, connect with you guys. I apologize for being away so long. I never intend to, uh, but a lot of times it's voice or just illness or workload. Um, and I don't want to deliver a bad show, right? If I was in a bad mood, I don't want. I've done that before, and that's not a good show. And so, for whatever reason, over the last ten years, that's the way it's gone. They'll be like, he hasn't missed a live stream in seven months, and then pff, guy hasn't live stream in four months. I don't know. My, my schedule can kind of get crazy with travel and, and illness and all that. And uh, yeah. How common is very hard water, but no buffer and 6.0 pH comes out of my tap. I don't know. I haven't really run into that. I've heard about it before, but I couldn't quantify. Is that super common or not? Um, I would probably add crushed coral to that water. It would slowly dissolve and buffered up the cage a little bit is what I would do to counteract that. That's what I would start. I don't know 100% that it works, but when I've recommended that in the past, people usually go, hey, that worked. And I go, great, sounds good. The award did come for the million because it's been weeks, right? Look at this chunky bad boy. Woo! Uh-oh, you, you can see all the stuff it takes to make this happen. Big expensive lights and, and other stuff, but yeah, got the, the one milli. Look at the size comparison to the 100,000. So there you go. I guess that doesn't do it very well. There you go. Yeah, took took 10 years roughly and uh, lots of money, blood, sweat, and tears, a team of 35 people throughout the company. And I think a lot of, a lot of the other YouTubers don't realize that 
we operate as a company because I think we do a good job of being hobbyists because I'm at, at my core, I'm a fish nerd to the to the end. Like I love fish. I love breeding fish. I love plants. But don't forget that we've got 35 families and their mouths to feed and all of that. And so we do things like advertising and, and all of the, you know, some people think that's that's evil, but I really try to approach it from a fair way. And by that, I mean, my goal is that you would be looking to buy a fertilizer and I get my fertilizer in front of you and not so much, uh, you know, be predatory of like, can we get gambling ads to kids or anything like that? I think it's a very healthy thing for businesses to advertise. I would recommend all of our RPP stores to do that. Get in front of the people that want to buy from you. That's that's always going to be good. And uh, we still regularly do that on YouTube. In fact, our competitors still do it on us too. And it's that's a thing of business. So I think what, you know, people looking in going, hey, they're just buying subs. We're not buying subs. We're advertising. And the result is we get subs. And if we're not advertising on our stuff, our competitors are. And so, um, yeah, so we invest a little bit of money, help keep that number going up, help bring in fresh blood. And uh, we also, we advertise for more than just us. Like, I take it upon myself. Our goal is to, you know, we're up to like almost 140 our retail partner stores to get more people into all of those. So if you haven't looked in a while, look in your state and go, hey, who's the RPP stores? Do they offer a discount? Where are they? How good do they look? And pay them a visit, you know, and then hopefully in two years, it's like, wow, there's 700 stores or something that we've just kind of, you know, found and built good bonds with, good re- working relationships with. And I think when we can get a big store uh, thing going, we then can work on clubs and stuff because now we've got stores that can support clubs. Like, hey, if we were to ship this to your store, can you donate this to the club? Could you help provide maybe fish of the month for them? We'll reimburse or whatever. And really just kind of take that, idea and run with it and see where it breaks because ideas aren't perfect you know and you run that and go oh that's where that breaks down okay put that back on the uh put that back on the the back burner and think about it for a while so how can you get rid of algae achieve balance that's the real answer with food slash fertilizer light co2 plant growth There's lots of videos and articles to help achieve that. But it's kind of like asking, how do I get a beautiful front yard? I want no dandelions. I want a nice rose bush. I want uh, the grass to always look like it's a golf course. And the answer is, well, you can't deliver that in a one minute little response. You can say like, well, you should probably read up on how to grow uh, roses. You should probably learn like the best way to get rid of dandelions, manual removal, uh, you know, not cutting the grass too short, uh, you know, fertilizing at the right time of year, all of those things. And as you start learning and developing those skills compared with time, as I learned in my own front yard, eventually you start going, Hey, I got less dandelions this year. Hey, I've got more of like my roses doing a little bit better. Uh, and those skills build on each other. And so that's kind of the way algae works. If you just, you know, keep reading and, you know, you can read someone's, this is how they do roses. And wow, that, that I cut it back too much. That didn't work out too well at all for me. And then you might read another article that says do the exact opposite. And maybe that works really well for you. And uh, just like outside of your house, you have a different climate. You have different roses. You have different light or shade you got to figure out what's going to work in your aquarium. You've got a different size. You've got a different light. You've got different plants. You've got different foods you feed. You've got different fish. You've got different water structure. You use different substrate. You clean more or less often than someone else does. You feed more or less often or just more. So there's all these little factors, and you kind of have to study some of the basics to get to the point where you can start going, ah, I'm seeing when I do this, this happens. And when I do that, that happens. And as you start putting a few of those together, you can start avoiding the results you don't want. And what, you know, some people want to grow algae. Like if you have uh, baby plecos you're raising or a bunch of reticulated hillstream loaches or shrimp or goldfish, 
and the next person doesn't want any. Some love snails, some don't. And so it, it, while it seems like such a basic answer, the most truthful answer anyone's going to be able to ever tell you is the basics are start achieving a, a tank that is more in balance after learning how to do that, and you will end up with more balance, which seems so obvious, but we all started somewhere and lots of concepts are hard to understand. Like, well, how do you ride a bike? Well, you ride a bike and then it goes like what? But when I sit on the bike, it falls over like, well, yeah, but you got to pedal and the pedal keeps you going. And, but as you learn that now you're like, well, yeah, you just ride a bike. And so learning those things and building those blocks is what human nature is all about. Of like everything is so foreign until it's not. And uh, aquariums are no different. They're foreign until you understand them. And, you know, you don't need to know exactly how centrifugal force and stuff like that works on a bike. You just kind of need to know like when I pedal, it go forward. And then you eventually learn, and I can take my hands off the handlebars and it still go forward. What? You know, you can learn these things. You don't necessarily need to know scientifically why. You just know, do thing. And that's where, you know, do thing, get result. That's what we I do in the fish room all the time with Dean. And that's why we call ourselves fish room science and that kind of stuff. Like, I don't know the scientific nerd way to say it. I can just say we've replicated this experiment. And it's what we do in the fish room. And this is what we experience in the fish room. And uh, you'll see that coming out in some videos we we shot on Friday, actually. One is a member-only video, so uh, the Little Junior and I know Fish Tank Barn and some other people donated some subs, so if you got those free memberships, you'll see a video coming out here in the next couple of weeks probably behind the scenes of making a video. And then we're also producing a video um, about our light. It's, it's going to be 100% a commercial. i got to do my job. So I had Dean do it because I said, well, Dean, be truthful. It's going to be weird coming from me. I make the light. Obviously, I'm going to say it's the best. Speak your truth. And, uh, but also in that, we did a lot of testing, and I'm going to get all the stats to uh, our team so that we can post the PAR uh, reviews, or not reviews, but the PAR readings on the light. I spent, uh, I bought a brand new PAR meter for like 650 bucks that specializes in reading PAR underwater because I wanted, uh, as I explained in the member video, I kind of want to be like Eheim. Eheim rates their canister filters filled with media. Everybody else that I'm aware of, I'm sure there's others that I'm not aware of, but everybody else that I am aware of, Fluval, hashtag you're tripping, they rate their canister filters without media. So like an FX6, you go, wow, 900 gallons per hour, that's crazy. But if you fill it with media, it's more like 400 gallons per hour. But 900 gallons per hour sounds crazy good. Same thing. I want to make sure that we're providing you PAR readings as accurate as our, we can in an actual fish room, in an actual aquarium setting that would be very close to the experience you would get with your aquariums and not, you know, there's competitor lights. Most competitor lights, when you look at it, says this is an open air reading. That doesn't account for what the water's doing. That doesn't account for how light gets filtered. It also... You know, what Dean and I learned a lot, actually, by we spent hours doing this and but we 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 really learned how you can juice the stats like you can just leave stuff out. If I just say, oh, uh, this is why we made the video background video so no one could be like, hey, you doctored it. We could have painted like all the sides of the aquarium white. And now all of a sudden in this aquarium, the par is now 30 percent brighter. Well, guess what? You can't see through white paint. You'd never keep an aquarium like that, but I technically wouldn't be lying. We took that par in an aquarium. And so an open air system could have been done on a white table. You're going to get more splash back into the sensor. You could put up, you could make a white box that would really juice the stats uh, and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that we were literally using it in an aquarium. And we learned, we learned that, uh, so the aquarium I had, we got it from uh, customaquariums.com, I think. Whoever all my other aquariums are from, I think it's custom aquarium. The back black background causes the par to go down by about 20% because we know that black substances absorb light. And so we were doing the corner testing. So not only did we just do a light test every inch. So I bought these acrylic blocks that were expensive and 
we went all the way from the bottom all the way up to like every normal tank size one uh, acrylic block at a time and then we did the corner so that you would know in like a an 18 inch tank what that would be in the corners and and you don't think about it till you're doing it you learn a bunch but oh you put it back towards the black background it's swallowing up some of the light so then we did the test actually in the front uh, because not everybody's gonna have a black background so uh, if you were trying to do a budget light maybe you would use white background or blue black's gonna reduce it a little bit but I think it looks the best and uh, you know we what we found was and it was it was not obvious until we did it but the especially in the corners the corners really had this like you would get a par reading for like the first three that were kind of similar. And then you'd get like six or seven. It's the exact same par. And then it would get really dark because the way that I got a hair like in my eyeball, the way the light would spread, right? It makes sense. If you have your light right here and it's spreading this way, you're going to get a band in that tank that is like pretty much the same par. And then, so it's actually a little bit darker, lower. And you're thinking further from the light. That makes sense gets a little bit brighter and then stays brighter for a chunk and then gets pretty darn dark at the top. Uh, and that's why I run two lights on my tanks turned way down so that the fish, when I feed them and they're on camera and they're up at the top, they still look good. Cause now I've got a light, you know, here and here and it spreads here and here for them at top while I'm filming where this. So if I was sitting in a chair, no problem. You bring a camera up, it's a problem. So, but all that will be, uh, we're working on blog articles and product description on the website and all that. We're going to get all that data and hopefully digestible uh, forms. We'll make a nerd link to link to like every every par reading by inch in the corner and in the center. And then we'll also have just here's what your par is at 100% on 5 gallon, 10 gallon, 20 long, uh, 20 high, 29, 55. 75 gallon 60 breeder we'll try to get as many of those like standard aquion sizes so you just point and shoot and you go i own this tank i'd have this par and then you guys can do the math because the reality is our light is is more powerful in my opinion than almost anybody needs and so you, a lot of our light should be run anywhere like dean runs them at 20 percent. i run most of mine at 40 percent um on really big tanks Maybe you're getting that 70, 80%, maybe 100%, like on the 800 gallon. I do run 100%, but uh, yeah. And there's a lot to know. You, you run duckweed or something, you need to crank that light up so you can get light past the duckweed. So there there are reasons to have that much light. Uh, or like my Valisneria tank where there's super dense Valisneria. You still want the crypts to get some light, so you crank it up. But if you, just, if you have a new tank and you're cranking it, that's where that algae comes in. It's not necessarily in balance with the amount of fertilizer you're doing and uh, the CO2 in the light. So, uh, Let's see here. Yeah, I love my black background. Painting the glass is kind of a pain. I like the oil-based Rust-Oleum paint for backgrounds. That's my favorite. Acrylic doesn't attach as well. The oil-based works really well for me. Uh, spray painting, you can do it, but uh, rolling on the oil-based Rust-Oleum my, my go-to for sure. And uh, I like black because it's a very neutral color and a lot of fish will pop against it. It doesn't show algae as much. A blue one, like in the store, we've got blue ones. We've got some other colors and every employee is like, Phew, sure do hate that tank because I got to scrape the background for algae too. So with the black one, not a problem. Yeah, YouTube said it wasn't starting for another 30 minutes. I've had... Long days, I, I call it like COVID brain basically where you, you sleep way too much while you're sick and then you can't sleep at all and then you, you do trips and stuff like that and here I am of just like normal stuff. I was like, yeah, I live stream at five and I click six and I should have known something up because another live streamer raged at me today and they, they canceled their memberships and said they'll never shop with me again because I'm live streaming while they live stream and I'm like, but why now? I've, I've been doing this time slot for a while. Like, I haven't done it that many times. I'm like, okay. And then when I was getting ready and it was like two minutes, I was like, nobody's talking. That's weird. I actually restarted uh, the browser and everything. I was like, is my thing broken? And then I realized, wait, that's not normal. And I said, oh, my gosh. I planned it for six. And so 
that's just me being a human at every day continually remind myself I'm just a dumb human like everybody you know overworked overstressed not enough time to play with fish and uh oh yeah okay yeah I'm 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 always far from perfect so uh, my apologies to the people that thought I was overstepping on their toes I didn't even realize I was as I told the person I didn't even know you live streamed at that time and here I was I thought that it was 5 p.m or 8 p.m eastern but they were actually talking about 9 p.m when they actually do but I didn't know that because I didn't know that I had screwed up my live stream. So, you know, you can, you can be irritating people without even knowing it. So I just try to, I try to make people happy with the people I know. If you show up, try to, I'll try to put on a good show, try to answer questions and we'll see what we can do. What are some fish that you would consider be, a beginner trap, so to speak? Uh, but for fish owners, uh, like what fish everyone thinks will go well and never does. Oh, this is easy. Almost every time I talk to someone who wants to open up their store and they said, I'm going to open up, I, I'm getting, I'm signing the lease in two months. They all have this notion that I'm going to sell what I can't find at the stores. And that is how they're going to win. And as a concept, it makes perfect sense. Everybody says they want XYZ. I'm going to sell XYZ because no stores is selling XYZ. What you quickly learn, a store like Aquarium Co-op isn't selling XYZ because there isn't enough buyers or there's problems with the supply chain line or uh, they come back too often or they eat other fish or, 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 or. So the real question to ask when you're going to open a store and you're bringing in the fish why is no one selling this fish? That's the question. If you look at Aquarium Co-op, like we can get any fish on the planet. We can sell it. Why aren't they selling it? That's the question to ask. And when you, you talk to all these store owners that have been open for a year, maybe two years, I, I always ask them like, I see you're starting to sell a lot more community fish. Yeah, that's what people want. It cohabitates. It doesn't become a problem later on. And I go, yeah, right? Like it's, you think it's all the rare pistos, all the rare plecos, all the rare arowanas, all the big catfish, all the Florida gars, all the, you know, brown, skunky live bears that nobody wants, anything that's rare. And that's, for the most part, 90% of what is rare is rare because there's not enough demand. There's 10% that it's rare and no one can make enough of it. And we bamboozle ourselves thinking, yeah, that's why everyone doesn't sell this stuff. And the reality is, the reason tetras and live bearers and which platies are and sword tails and corridoras and loaches and angelfish, the reason why all those are popular is because people like them and they're popular. Uh, I always chuckled in my own store when, when people would say, oh, that fish is too common. I don't want those. And I, I would always tell them, well, you realize they're very common because they're awesome, right? You don't hear people say, well, I'm not going to keep a dog. Everybody keeps dogs. You keep dogs because dogs are awesome. Same with cats. You know, like that's in our, our human brain. There's just X amount through our lives. Where we're like, but I want to be the different one. And I get it. I've done it. But the reality is at a certain point, you want what works and you want what is tested and you've got a big support system and all of that. And it's a lot easier when you're going, oh, everybody loves this. Let me try this. Oh, this is amazing. Things don't become popular because they're terrible for the most part. Some influencers can do some stuff like that. But in general, why are neon tetras? Why are they one of the most sold fish over the last like 50 years? Because neon tetras are awesome. That's why. Same with guppies. Same with a lot of these common fish. If red tail catfish were as cool as everybody thought, they'd be the number one sold fish. But they get really big. They've got big food bills. They go poop real big. They can attack you, they can swallow other fish, there's a myriad of problems with them, and that's why they'll never be as popular. And just because something's popular doesn't mean it's not cool. And just because something is super popular doesn't mean you think it's cool. But in general, don't let yourself go, everybody does that, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, I, I think it's, in at least in my life, I definitely was that way when I was younger, wanted to be the contrarian, and now I know, do it for you. If you are, you know, don't let what someone else is doing influence what you want to do. If you think that fish is beautiful, do it. 
And I've got fish in my fish. Why would you keep that? Oh, I don't like that fish. And it's like, I have to remind people sometimes, well, good, because it's my fish room and I love it. You should totally not keep that in your fish room. Yeah, we all get to keep what we like. And I always try to bring it back to like food or something like, oh, you don't like pizza? Great. Never order pizza. Problem solved. You don't like Mexican food? Don't eat Mexican food. I do. I'm going to keep it in my fridge. So, yeah, easy. Everybody thinks, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, carry all the stuff that is not common. And usually they just get into trouble going, oh, my gosh, not enough buyers. Who knew? You know, like a Faka puffer. I can order a bag of Faka puffers uh, and they're stupid cheap, but you get 60 of them. No store in the world basically can move 60 Faka puffers to homes that'll be a good home. Same with red tail cats and, and a lot of these other crazy fish, even though the margin is crazy good. And that's why we need wholesalers. You need a wholesaler to go, well, they got 60 Faka puffers and they're going to sell 60 of them to 60 different stores. So, yeah. Do I have time to play games anymore? I didn't until I got COVID. I spent two weeks and I started playing EverQuest again. So, uh, if you're looking for something to do and you're a super nerd and you used to play EverQuest or still do, uh, there is a custom server called RetroQuest that I put some time in from time to time. And, uh, yeah, it's fun. But... I like it because it's a slow enough game. I can still do email and I can still put it down and go do my meetings. Like I was playing for, for a bit before this and I said, ah, I got to go to work. And so I did. And uh, I used it to fill in. I played actually, I played a little bit at the airport while we were coming back from New Mexico because the flight got delayed and, and uh, we ended up spending like five hours in the airport. So my back, I was all hunched over, really looked like a, you know, like a dungeon troll, just like I'm playing my game. But, uh, yeah, past time a little bit. Katie was reading Reddit and, and watching little videos and we're watching people and just trying to pass the time. <laughs> trying to fertilize my my plastic plants. You, you think that's a joke, but people have li literally asked that. Uh, let's see. <laughs> to be honest, if you don't like Mexican food, something's off. I've met plenty of people that, that don't, and usually it's like a, a spice thing or it doesn't agree with their stomach or, um, you know, I've had friends and, and family and stuff like maybe you've got gluten problems or, or whatever, some kind of allergy and some of those foods stuff can like sneak in and you just don't know. And so, uh, you just might avoid it. So, but yeah, in general, eat what you want to eat. I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of eating what you like to eat. I mean, I'm pretty much the, uh, the poster child for that. So. Whenever I finally get that good, good Ethernet direct from the Wi-Fi 6 modem. <laughs> yep. I almost, man, I'm so close to tattling on myself with our big project like every minute. I almost chimed in with something like that and I was like, that would have got me. It's not in trouble, but I've been like, mm, put my foot in my mouth. It's hard to find a vet for your pet gator. Yeah, that, I mean, so not exactly the gator but like Murphy and stuff, when I lost Hank originally, I was contacting all the local wet vets. So that, that means your local vet that would do dogs and cats, but they specialize also in exotic animals and also have someone on staff that is gone to schooling for fish. Well, everybody, we'd finally get on the phone and be like, yeah, you got to talk to Dr. Tim Miller Morgan because he's basically the guy that teaches them. And they're like, yeah, you're Mabu Puffer. I, I I learned to like to inject koi with antibiotics and some other stuff, but Mabu puffers are so specialized that it's that alligator syndrome of like, there's only a couple people in the world that really know the anatomy and how they work internally and what might actually work. And like, you know, th that might have the answers to the questions I don't have. So for instance, I ended up doing what's called aspirating the swim bladder on Hank. Horrible procedure, cried my eyes out. You basically got to stick a needle into their swim bladder and let the air out so that maybe they can write themselves. But I had questions like, okay, if I let that out, will they ever be able to puff up again? Is that, is that, does that just kill them in two weeks? And he ended up not making it either way. There was a, 
he had a wild caught disease because almost all of them were always wild caught. There was nothing I could have ever done. But Dr. Tim Miller Morgan, when that was going on, he was in the Amazon out of contact from any other human, basically. So uh, even if I could have got him on the phone, wouldn't have really helped. You need to diagnose. You need to be there in person. And he's got lots of tools. He's got ultrasound for fish and stuff. He was showing me at one of the, the things I went to. Super cool. Uh, but yeah, you get these crazy exotic pets and the support for them is not not nearly as much. Where you get a guppy, you got a guppy with something going wrong. Well, now whole internet's experts on guppies will tell you everything you're doing wrong. You ever owned a goldfish before? Ten different people will all tell you you're doing it wrong, even though you're going, yeah, but this, this person this person said the opposite. And they both say the other person's an idiot. But what am I supposed to make of that? So, yeah, you can have crazy rare stuff. You can have crazy common stuff, too. And that's why I'm always going to advocate do the best you can, learn through the process the best you can, and next time, hopefully you get a, a slightly better result. That's, that's, the best, that's the best thing I got. Uh, let's see here. Mentioning Aqualog in the Glasser Tour, the puffer log photos helped me ID my mystery pow puffer species, now I'm on the hunt for more supplement pages. Yeah, so Aquarium Glazer or Glasser, uh, they make, now it's a, quite an old publication, the Aqualog, and they really did some really good documentation of fish species and all that. And it was cool. While we met the guy that kind of does that, while he was there, he was still, they still document new species and they're putting out in their newsletter and everything. And so it's it's cool to see a facility that, yes, they sell tons of fish all throughout the world, but they still have a wing of like, like we're still dedicated to this. And I, I, I think I try to take little pages from businesses I see like that of like, yes, as a company, we have to make money and all of these people are dedicated to doing that. But then also like, but we also have this 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 wing of hob making the hobby better that doesn't make us money. Like they don't really make money off of the photos and the time that person's spending. Yes, they become reputable, but you know, it, it, it does the hobby overall better. And uh, it's not, also not a bad thing if it did make money. I, I wish it did. Like, could you imagine if there was lots of money in being a wet vet and documenting fish? We'd all know so much more. Like, it'd be great. So I'm never afraid to have people make money from something that I enjoy uh, because usually it gets better. Not always, but, you know, if there's no money in anything that you enjoy, almost never does it get better. So when there is money, you know, for advertising or equipment upgrades or interest or whatever typically that thing can evolve doesn't mean it will but it can without the money it pretty much can't all right super psyched to see the facebook alert today Ooh, maybe someone posted it in the, the facebook group i was doing that for a while but candy seems to be so good at it i've been leaving it to her how did I originally get connected with Chris Lukup and Oliver Knott? Any shortened version of the stories? <laughs> is that is that a is that a slide on I tell long stories? Uh, so f back when I was new to the hobby, I was a super fan nerd of Takashi Amano and Oliver Knott. Oliver Knott's style, in my opinion, is like nobody else that I've seen, um, and that's why we work with him today. He's Hang, he, every day he makes a post and he hangs out in our Facebook group and and we we, we pay him for that because uh, he's got he's got expertise and he's seen the hobby from so many perspectives. Um, so I was a super fan of him. Didn't know anything about Chris Lukup, and at an aquatic experience actually, I went to uh, I went to there and I saw the shrimp contest and I'd always loved shrimp. I was, I had bought some on Aquabit. I was making good money on them. I was a shrimp nerd, but I had no idea who this guy was. He's a real shrimp nerd. I was just a shrimp, shrimp pimp seller guy. But I had a booth, uh, and he had a booth and we, I feel like it was a little bit mutual. Like, man, that guy is super busy over there. And he was kind of doing, man, that guy is super busy over there. Like what? Well, that's crazy. And the way Chris tells it is he wanted to come and say hi and everything because he thought it was crazy that we were handing out shirts to everybody. He had never seen anybody do anything like that before. And uh, so I met I met Chris there. And I was like, cool, you're rocker guys into shrimp. Nice to meet you, Chris. Didn't know. 
he's the shrimp king and like is the guy to know. Had no idea. I'm just busy doing my, I'm a YouTuber thing. It's fine, right? So I'm like, yeah, nice to meet you. Cool. And uh, that was pretty much it. So then uh, I go to interview for the first time ever, which is the Germany show. And uh, we're there, and I think um, uh, Corvus Oscar and I are there because Fluval flew us there because we were uh, the best dealer of Fluval. Actually, no, at that point, we were like second or third, and they were taking the top three. Uh, so they flew us there, and we're at Inner Zoo, and we're like, oh my gosh, that's George Farmer over there, and oh, oh, that's, you know... So we went to talk to George Farmer, and then I was like, Chris, yeah, I met you once before, and, and Chris is kind of just the nicest person on the planet, and he knew way more about me and remembered me way more than I remembered him because he's, he's got that superhuman skill. And uh, so we were sitting down and just talking and all of that, and he got me, he's like, you need food? He's like, my booth is doing food. So he got me uh, like some white sausages, and he like went and got beers, but I don't drink, and he is just always in, no matter who's in the room, he wants to make sure you feel as special as possible. Like he is this crazy selfless guy that he would never admit that. He would tell you all of his faults. He's that kind of guy. Like, no, I'm terrible in all of these ways. Uh, but so that was super cool because I knew nobody. You know, I'm here in Germany. I'm just like, ah, look, there's Eheim and there's this. And, you know, I'm just, just a YouTuber guy. But he knew me from the States, and so he's like, hey, come on over here. And he, he was smart enough to know that I'm not going to know anybody. And so he kind of took me under his wing, and I learned all kinds of stuff. And he's like, well, are you going to the, the big dinner tonight? And I'm like, uh, and Katie was there with me, by the way. Or no, on that trip. No, Katie was not on that trip because uh, I remember she would have loved it. But I was like, no, we're not going to, well, actually, I was like, well, let me check with Fluval. Maybe, maybe they bought us some dinner tickets. And it turns out they didn't because Fluval was doing that night. Uh, they had go-go dancers and open bar. And that, Joel and I did not drink at all. So we're like, eh, that's, they still want us to show up and like, they wanted to impress us so we'd sell more lights, right? And I was like, yeah, that's not my scene. And so Chris Lukup was like, don't worry, Corey, I will find you some tickets. And so then it comes to dinner time, and Chris is freaking out. He only found one ticket, and because each booth had to pre-buy tickets and all this stuff, and he he gave Joel and I tickets, and he's like, "Well, go up there. I, I I just won't go." And I'm like, "No, there's no way. We're taking your tickets, and you're not going." But he was totally cool with it. He's like, "Nope, that seems great." Uh, and so eventually we found another ticket. Like it was, it, it took another like 30 minutes, and he was running around. And he was doing all that, but. He, he very much has the never leave someone behind vibe. And so we got to go up there and it was crazy. They had like lots of circus performers on stilts and like, oh, over there, that's a table with Heiko Blair and like all these big wigs. And, you know, I'm just a, a nerd. I'm eating my food. It's going, oh, my God, this is so surreal. And uh, so that was the kind of the, the I think that was the true meeting of Chris Lukup for me where I was like, this guy, he, he's on top of the world. And he made he really went out of his way and took like hours to make sure little old me and Joel were included. And so from then on, we kind of just had this bond and we would take people out to ice cream at events and we do all that because he didn't drink either. So it worked out really well. Like, oh, us three don't drink. Like, it was perfect. And so at every event and that kind of stuff, we'd spend a lot of, spend a lot of time together. And then now he claims that I don't, I don't drive insane, which I find that impossible because that's my wife. I drive everybody insane. Uh, he says, anytime I want to go, and he, he really, truly means it, which is weird. He's like, anytime. You're like, you don't have to tell me. Just tell me what time I pick you up from the airport. So, like, this last trip in, in January, like, a couple weeks before, I'm like, how about January 1st to the 15th? And he says, you know, you literally can always come here. And uh, he likes it because I can do my own thing. So, he can be doing his work. I can be doing my work. We can also go visit a thing like Gigazoo. And, yes, we do stuff together, but he doesn't feel like he has to... You know, like I'm, I'm fine eating a sandwich twice in the day and not leaving the house and doing aquarium co-op work. And he's doing work for uh, Garnelio and we're just talking fish and we're just grinding out work. And then we go have a day where we do something fun and cool. And then we go back to the work and, uh, and he's come, he's come and stayed with us in the United States before. And he's supposed to come 
uh, this year as well. And stay some with us, and we're going to travel all around, and we'll probably we'll probably be a lot of pop-ups like, hey, we're in Alabama, who wants to meet up for dinner? So you got to watch our YouTube channels and stuff for those kind of announcements. But yeah, crazy enough, like it just seems that we mesh really well. There's an age gap difference. There's we're, we're in different countries in the world, but somehow we both really put value in making sure everybody's included, figuring stuff out for ourselves, uh, not assuming, not only going after the money. We, we realize money is the, the key that unlocks the thing you want to do, but not the whole thing, you know, like maybe we can get someone to sponsor our trip. Let's go to Papua New Guinea. Let's do this. Let's do that. Like, let's bring the pictures and the video and the stuff to the people for free. Uh, and I, I resonate that with that and he resonates with that. And I, over the trips more and more, he would see that I try to be very giving. He was very giving. And it worked out really well where we stopped having to ask, are we going to do this? It just, of course we're going to do that. Like, we're going to print all these posters and we're going to give them away. Even if we can sell them, like, no, we're going to give them away. It makes more sense to give them away. We'll build the hobby. It'll be better. And so uh, that's where you've, you know, you may have seen me at, at different Germany shows. We did Vivarium one year. We brought in Danny's Aquarium there. We tried to, we tried to other, invite other YouTubers, but it's kind of oil and water. And I won't name them, but a lot of them kind of want to party. At those events, we don't want to party. We want to party with the fans. And by party, I mean go eat ice cream and hang out and be like, what are you reading? Oh, I haven't seen that before. That's a great picture. And, uh, yeah. And I think he saw that at the Aquatic Experience because I don't remember if it was that one that we did, but I, I took all the fans. I said, hey, we're going to to Red Robin. And we, we everybody ate at Red Robin, and that was a good time. And we've done that kind of stuff. And that's always my goal because... I, when I went to my first convention, which was a library convention, I didn't drink, I didn't know anybody, and so once the event was over, I would just go and sit in my hotel room, and then the next morning, I would go eat breakfast and not know anybody, and it sucked, and so I remember everybody that reached out to me, and I've always tried to, like Greg Sage was one of those people, I remember distinctly, I was sitting there just eating alone, and uh, Carl Trochu, which I've shown you his outdoor fish room in in Florida, came and sit down on my table. He's like, "Hey, can I sit here?" And and I knew who he was because I was I was nerding out hard. I'm like, "This guy is Miami Swordtails. He's got some of the coolest platies and swordtails in the world." And he and his son sit sat down. And we just had a normal conversation. It was amazing. And so now that I have, am in a position where I can kind of show off some of their work and stuff. I try to go out of my way to, you know, say, Hey, make sure you're buying cool stuff from Greg Sage <coughs> and Carl Trochu, when he does show up to the, the events and stuff like that. And, you know, I've got fish in my room from those guys. And, you know, I, 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 I won't name the names, but there are a lot of elite fish people that when I was not on YouTube and I and Aquarium Co-op was not big, they literally would just snub me. I remember I was telling a story to someone just a couple days ago where I had met these idols and I, I just said, oh, wow, so nice to meet you. I love the work you do. And I remember they were standing in a group at an aquatic experience. They looked at me and I just said, oh, yeah, nice to meet you. And I didn't have, I wasn't famous then or anything like that. Not that I'm that famous now. But they, I remember they they looked at me. And then went back to the conversation. I remember just dying inside going, uh, do I walk away now? Like this is as awkward as I could be. And here I've spent thousands of dollars plane ticket hotel to go connect with my other fish nerds. And I just remember feeling like this is horrible. And so to me, I, I, I said, I will try as hard as I can that hopefully no one else will ever have to have that experience while I'm around. I try to make the time even if I'm on my bad Santa lunch break where it's like I haven't taken a drink or eaten in hours, I try to, you know, I know people drive. There's people that drove six hours to come see us at the the New Mexico event and that kind of stuff. And I try to lead my whole business and most of my life of I've been in those shoes. I've had that happen. That sucked. I will minimize the amount of times I do that to other people because no one's perfect. But I will, I will go out of my way and I'll try to continually remind myself, don't be that person. Uh, and now, you know, I, 
I haven't really worked with any of them. I have filmed with some of, of those types of people and it's, it's, I don't, I don't like it. I like to document what they've done, but I don't forget how they treated me when I was nobody. But now that we're somebody, it's a completely different way. And I don't like that. I don't, humans are humans. And that's why I try to go out of my way to hang out with people like, uh, like a John Oliver at the events at, uh, trying to think of other people, not so much YouTubers, but just, I try to just make friends and there's probably 20 people in the chat. I don't know how many people we even have here today, but they probably remember at some point where we were sitting at ice cream or some other thing. And I'm just trying to be a normal person and try to actually be interested in their hobby. Cause I am interested in the hobby. And, uh, I think that's very important for the hobby in general, to not let elitism take over. <coughs> uh, sorry, still got that kind of phlegm going. And I just went on like an hour-long rant straight between all the stories, so. All right. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I, not unfortunately, that's not the right word. There is a level of fame that comes with what we've done and it's the most flattering thing on the planet and also kind of annoying sometimes. I would never say I don't want it, uh, but I hope to be like, it would sound too cliche, but I can't think of other people other than like a Keanu Reeves or something. Like I understand why the media freaks out. You're like, look, Keanu Reeves took the subway. And then not that I'm on, I'll ever be at his level, but I'm like, yeah, but he's just a normal human. Like, that shouldn't be a crazy thing. Like, if Keanu Reeves eats at a McDonald's, like, he's just a normal human being. And that's what I try to be is, like, don't elevate yourself above people. Try to be just on the same level with them. And so, for instance, when we're doing dinners and that kind of stuff and ice cream shops and that kind of stuff at events... I purposely don't pick fancy places. I go, it needs to be very affordable for everybody. And if someone says they can't pay, we'll pay for them because we don't want to exclude. And, uh, you know, I remember I met uh, a father and his son and his son was a little bit special needs in a wheelchair and everything. And they were kind of feeling left out because we had sat, I think it was at a Portillo's, it, one of the Chicago shows. And I remember I got up and I went and sit down at that table because it, they, I could see them being excluded because humans in general, they go, ah, kind of some special needs going on over there. I'm going I'm to sit over here. And so I went out of my way to sit over there so that people would have to come to us. I don't think it's, I don't think it's right when people get excluded, uh, even if they're choosing to do it. Like most people won't make the choice to come to an event and then get exclu excluded. They kind of come to an event hoping they'll be folded in in a way that they will like. Um, which there are some people that are, it's, it's a little bit too much and they need that distance. So I try to, I try to, uh, accommodate that as well, but you can, I, I feel like if I'm doing my job right, I can kind of get the spidey sense of like, I bet you they would, they'd be having a better time having a conversation with someone as opposed to they showed up, they're just eating and they're looking kind of bored. And so, you know, my, my job is to entertain, to make sure everyone has a great time. And that's why I always beat up all the shows. I think they could do so much more to make sure everybody has a good time. When that father and son show up, when you and your, your daughter shows up, when you and your cousin or your mom shows up, it's not like, time to go get drunk. What are we doing after 6 p.m.? I know I, with Primetime Aquatics, when they're kids who are now like bodybuilders, which is crazy, uh, many years ago, I remember we all went and watched uh, the movie Thor because they wanted to, and they were like super fans of me. And I was like, yep, we're going to see Thor tonight. It started like 9 p.m. And because I don't have a reason to say no. And it made, they had a great time. And so pretty much if everybody's going to have a good time, I'm down. Like I will, I will go do stuff I don't want to do if other people have a great time. Because that's when I'm in an event and everything, that's my job. And I don't only do it because it's my job, but. It's the right thing to do. That's more important, I think. Uh, let's see here. I got to start looking into events near me. Got to be something in Florida. I'm sure there's at least an Aquashella. I think I know the Liber event is in Florida. And it's like a five-day thing. I'm 
I'm on the, do I go to that? Don't I go to that train right now? I don't know. I don't want to commit, so don't buy based on what I'm doing. I haven't committed anything. Uh, but yeah, lots of events going on in, in Florida for sure. <laughs> when are we getting a co-op coin of the pups? You're riling up my wife. She's always wanting to make merch about our dogs, and I have to go, yes, I think that's cool, but it's got to be economically viable, and there's other stuff to get done ahead of that. Otherwise, we would just, everything, like, our sponge filters would be in the shape of Sassy's head with googly eyes. I met Jason and Joanna from Primetime Aquatics at a club, and they were super down to earth and brought me into the conversation. Yeah, they are great people. I love that they make their own shirts. I've met their kids. They used to bring their kids to the shows. Now they're kind of teenagers and almost adults now. And uh, good people. That's, you know, good people will go out of their way to bring people in and make them feel included. And it's a hard skill to learn. You got you to gotta have the confidence to do it, and uh, also the awareness. My wife will continually remind me, like, hey, ask them if they want a picture or something, because I'm, my, my brain's going a million miles an hour. I'm just trying to, like, Who, who's, who's having fun? What's the next thing? And uh, sometimes I'll just totally gloss over stuff, and then I feel bad, because she knows I think about it later going, I never, I never thanked them, or I never, never asked them if they wanted a picture, or if there's anything I could do for them. And I'll stew on that going, oh, I failed so hard in that opportunity, uh, and I got to get better. So she she will help keep me more honest with that. I'm like, hey, you told me you wanted me to tell you when you screwed up like this. And I go, I do. I want to get better. The American Library Association Convention is in Tampa, Florida this year, says the Fish Tank Barn. Yeah, Fish Tank Barn would be another good, good example of normal dude I really click well with. And I encouraged him to get into YouTube, follow his YouTube channel. But uh, he was always dad van. He always brought a van and he would always drive us around. And that was so helpful. Like, yes, we could request that the the venues and stuff, like you got to get us a car and you got to do all this. But I'd rather sit in the car with another fish nerd. And he's like, oh, over there, you got this. And there's a breeder that lives over there. This place is great to eat at. This is this. And uh, by doing that, I get to like buy their meals and stuff. And then I get to charge it to the company of like, yeah, we didn't take an Uber, but you got to buy Mike's dinner because he drove us. So yeah, most, most YouTubers are great, by the way. Um, even, even I've had some, I've had some experience with some where you're like, oof, but I also give them leeway because I know what it's like to have been on all day and you just flew yesterday and you're taking time off work and this and that. And not everybody can always be on all the time, uh, myself included. So, um, but yeah, for the most part, everyone's super cool. <laughs> Tyler, I remember when we met at the airport. You were awesome. Had a great conversation, even though you just got off a red eye. <laughs> I remember that too, Tyler. I was sitting in the lounge and... You know, that's where that, that being famous thing is awesome and kind of crappy. Not that our experience is crappy. It was, it was really cool. Um, but, like, let's say I got off a red eye and I was sick. You really don't want the, oh, my gosh, here's a fan. Because I instantly go, got to make this cool for the fan. And so we got to chat. I got to learn about your your business and what you do. And we've been we've had emails since and all of that. Carson Anderson here is in the chat. Glad to see you doing well, buddy. I keep following you on Facebook. Uh, you know, getting the haircuts the other day. I like to see that. There's so many people that have helped me. And also, I've tried to to be, a you know, an acquaintance for them. And I think that's, that's one of my favorite parts about this is I'm an introvert naturally. I just would not leave the house. And I never had very, very many friends. And I don't have very many close friends now even. But it forces me out of my comfort zone. So I... I if I, I wouldn't know half the people I know if it wasn't for YouTube and Aquarium Co-op Co kind of took off. And a lot of us fish nerds are that way. You meet these other company owners and they're just, uh, you know, they're just a fish nerd like me. We're like, we're not meant to be interacting with the public. Like we're, we're meant to be in the basement breeding fish. Like that's who we are. But you're kind of thrown into that. Like I need to be a normal human now. This is so foreign to me. I, I do think I should make dog coins that are similar to like Dogecoin, but with our dogs, that'd be kind of funny. 
at Aquashella, my two-year-old was melting down, and Johanna brought him a sticker, which was awesome. Yes, it's those little things that when I see out of the corner of my eye, I like, I, I, I give him a star, a gold star, like, yep, Primetime Aquatics will always be, they're like, they're good people. They are good people. Uh, let's see here. Will my easy flow sponges ever reach the UK? The flow is super impressive and normal sponge filters aren't quite cutting it. I think at some point, yes, we're always trying to get bigger and better. And, and honestly, if I'm being honest right now, we are, we're working on a big project and we are cash strapped. <laughs> not, not so much like we're paying bills and all that kind of stuff, but uh, to make a project like let's launch in the UK, like that takes at least like a quarter million dollars and we just don't have that kind of money. So I know that you can't buy from us at the moment, which is unfortunate. Other people, if you're buying from your RPP store, buy our stuff or buy from our stuff online. That helps inch these projects forward. And some of them, you know, like when we'll be in the UK, I don't have a date, but the more money we make, the more I can put towards that, the sooner it will happen. Uh, we just have some other big hurdles. Got to open up the retail store. Got the other thing going on. Got some other stuff going on. Uh, got a couple products we're waiting to launch. And uh, yeah. Being a normal human's overrated. <laughs> yeah, I'm like a closet human. I just, a real crazy nerd at home. And then it's like, I have to go out into public. Like, ah, other people, they care. Looks like they care about fashion other stuff and like but no one's looking at this crazy bug on the sidewalk what's wrong with these people imagine if aquarium co or imagine there's an aquarium co-op crypto there's an aquarium co-op crypto somehow we'd get involved in some kind of scandal and it would ruin us so i'm not i'm not touching uh crypto with a 10-foot pole with the aquarium co-op brand that even if it went right somehow it would go wrong like that's and I'm not doom and glooming crypto. There's just 4 billion different like meme coins slash dishonest coins. And I, I don't want to even be close to any of that. Is the Cryptocorn Nuri stock going to be back in soon? <sighs> Brain work. Is Cryptocorn Nuri going to be back in stock soon? We order some every week and we're only bringing in like 30 tissue cultures of each one each week. So they sell really fast. Because I'm still not convinced uh, we can sell tons and tons of tissue cultures. And also, I know the farms can't keep up with that. If I were 500, they'll just laugh at me. Be like, oh, we got 42. Uh, so they usually come in, usually, depending on customs, because they're in from Canada. Uh, they usually come in somewhere between Wednesday and, and Friday. So you can put in the thing, get a notification, or you can check um, every day. And we get 30 of them, and people buy them, and, and we're slowly... Uh, Slowly add more. How's the store expansion going? Uh, I can't say too much, but we're 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 complying with uh, with city requirements that they're they're requiring stuff that isn't even in our current store. There's there's laws that have passed since we opened our original store that require us to do some things, and so I actually have a meeting with architects. Uh, and we're deciding if we need to hire other specialist uh, experts. We need like an HVAC expert. We need seismic activity experts. We need a couple other things to satisfy these requirements to continue to move on to occupancy. Uh, and so it's it's been, you know, a slow battle. And then it's been taking a while because the city of, of Edmonds, uh, they state that they're understaffed in some of these areas. And so we'll submit a thing, and then we got to wait like six weeks, and then they'll go like, hey, this thing's almost right, do this, we'll review it again, like, well, that's another six weeks. So we're just we're just jumping through the hoops, and, and you know, like, oh, we need to do that? Okay, we'll do that. One of them, for instance, you know, this is a very baseline one. So the whole store is going to be connected, right? We're going from 1,000 square feet to 3,000 square feet. And in the architect plans, it does not show another ADA accessible counter, so one is exactly 36 inches. So if someone's in a wheelchair, they could check out. But we go back to them and go, hey, but 17 feet this way, there is one because you had us put one in originally. We built the original store. Uh, and then they're coming back with, yeah, we don't care. Put one in over here too. And I'm like, okay, well, 
let's figure out where we're going to put in another ADA counter. So we're meeting with the architects, like, where are we going to, what are our options to do this? Like, we'll have two ADA accessible counters now. Uh, so it's just some stuff like that. Um, and we'll get through it. So, yeah. We're, you know, we're very much in the, we just want to comply at this. We just also want to be able to afford it and make it happen too. I don't want to like make the store worse. You know, one of the ideas is like, well, tear down some of the counters and rebuild one at three feet high. And it's like, yeah, but it's so rarely used. Like our, our current ADA counter, we have people coming in wheelchairs and we do offer it to them. To the best of my knowledge, at least when I worked in there, it has never been used. They, so we have a 36 inch counter and we have like a, a 42 inch counter. So far, everybody has elected to use the 42 inch counter. So, uh, but you know, I get it. You comply with rules because there's people that wouldn't comply with rules and make it so difficult and, and all of that, that, you know, as a society, we all got to get better together. So we will, we will do what we can and we will make the things happen as they need to. Will the Corning Co-op sell live foods like stores showed in the in Europe? No, there's pretty much nobody in America doing those live foods. Like they have a bunch of companies that will do that in Europe, but no one has really pioneered that. Also, we're spread out a ton in America. So I, I don't know how many stores you need per live food packager business would make sense, right? Because if you're selling like a thing of glass worms for a dollar fifty, how many of those have to get done per store to pay for like the gas, the van, the insurance, the driver, the person that packed it, and the building doing it? You might go, yeah, we got to move a thousand units a, a week to make that happen, like because we're only, you know, or a month or whatever. So um, I think it would be cool. A lot of stores would would utilize it, but uh, I don't know. I think you'd see it maybe. Uh, in the East Coast a bunch, and maybe one or two in the West Coast, like maybe in California, because the population's dense enough, and you'd probably see a, a pretty big hole in uh, the Midwest. That being said, if you had it on the coast, a lot of it probably could be getting shipped, which would work really good. But need somebody to go, hey, I'm going to do this big project, and we get all the cultures, I'm going to learn how to replicate it all, how to keep it well, how to, to ship it well, how to do all these things. And uh, they, I think they'd have a pretty lucrative business at the end, but it might be high startup costs and stuff. I don't know. I'm not, I haven't really been in that business. So I got to visit the co-op store this week. I picked up Dean's Electric Blue Acaras and flew them home with me. Big thanks to Colin, who works in the store. I'll be back in a month or so. Yeah, Dean just brought me uh, some Blue Acaras as well. So maybe I'll get lucky and they'll breed for me also. Yeah, I, I, I think it's... You know, when I originally built the Corian Co-op, I never thought it would, like, one, I was young, and I, I didn't really realize there's X amount of people that just travel all the time for work. But I never thought, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that, like, come to my store and fly home with fish. It happens all the time. Because we get, you know, cool stuff and, and all that. But I just never, that never crossed my mind, because at the time, I had never, you know, as a, as a normal human, I feel like you don't fly that much. Now in this job, I fly all the time. But... As a normal, just like, yeah, you fly like maybe once a year to a vacation place. But, you know, people like Zenzo and maybe Tyler, you might be flying. Like Zenzo, before he started working for us, he was flying like, I don't know, it was like four days out of every week he'd be away from home at least. And I was like, that's crazy. He would do something like 200 plus flights a year. I was like, whoa. I can't, I, I don't like travel that much. So that much airport would drive me crazy. How do you fly with fish? That's a good, yeah, Tyler, chime in how you fly with fish. In theory, the way it's supposed to work is you have the fish in water, you present them, and they go, hey, that's fish in water, and because the fish are alive, that basically guarantees it's not a bomb or gasoline or something, and they can still always veto it, but from what I see is you basically are straightforward with it. They go, yeah, those are fish. That's fine. Carry them on. Um, in the United States, international, you're importing and you're dealing with that kind of stuff. And I keep wanting to try it, but I haven't, I haven't found too many fish in America 
that I want to fly home with. I also don't do that many events. Or when I do the events, I don't really go to the stores to like find fish. So uh, I do want to try it though, because I, I do think it'd be a good skill set to document well, have a blog article well done, and all of that. Because I think all of us that aren't doing it all the time are like, I know it can be done, but I really got to do a lot of research and I, maybe I just don't do it. Like I, I'm so timid when it comes to that. Like I, it sounds like people could yell at me and this could be a big hassle. I, no, I'm just not doing it. So, but yeah, as far as I know, they, they just stay in your carry on. And they could go like under the seat in front of you or up above you to the best of my knowledge. So, but that being said, I have not had the opportunity to do it yet. I've flown with fish home from another country, but I've not done it in the United States where it's just a carry on. I have only done it in checked. Uh, if you can fly out of a smaller airport, they might not have TSA. Yeah. I, I don't think you need to sneak it. I think for most people, you just... Yeah, so Tyler says, I did exactly what Corey said. I, I actually brought my Mabu Puffer with me from an RPP store outside of Detroit, Fishy Biz, uh, and I've not yet had a problem. Usually the TS people are excited for the fish. Yeah, I from all I've heard is basically like if you just go in and you're like, you know, you got to realize TSA people are used to dealing with people that are super angry. They got to get metal detected or they're trying to smuggle in the latest uh, apple beetle that's going to ruin the world or something. So that when they're like, hey, look at this dope fish. It's going to be my new pet. I'm so excited. Right. And they're just like, yeah, that looks like a fish. And most times like anything I need to know about that. Nah, it's just going to be in the bag. I'm going home. And they go, all right, cool. Yeah. Uh, and then they usually like, uh, person above me, do we, do we put this in a scanner or not? I, and then someone else kind of goes, it looks fine. And then that's kind of how I've seen it go down. That being said, I would, I, maybe I should do that. Maybe I need to do that. Maybe that needs to be my thing. Like I start doing it every time I fly so that I can document experiences and really get a good feel for it. Like, Hey, one out of 10 times I ran into this problem or someone had this question or yeah. And, and really kind of streamline that process. So maybe I just start buying like when I go somewhere like, yeah, give me six platies and I put them in a bag and I show up and I'm like, I got six platies are coming home with me and just document that process. And then after doing that 10 times, Oh, I, I never got denied or whatever. Repetition will help me uh, get that done. Tyler says one airport had me open the bag and they tested my water, had to rebag it at TSA, but it was good. See, there you go. So maybe one out of 10 times, you know, ooh, and yeah, I had to prove the water or something. Good to know. Yeah, Mo says, I'm usually TSA pre-check, and it's even easier that way. Good to know. Uh, let's see here. Is the GN talk, who's the better judge, going to be different than our last one? I loved your last one and the one on her Randy's podcast. I don't know off the top of my head. I would assume so because she's got a lot of talks and stuff she can do. Um, but I don't know. I didn't schedule the, the talk. I just show up. Even... Like, I've heard Greg, Greg Sage say the same talk, like, three times. He's got, like, a bunch of talks. But I've seen one, like, three times. And each time he tells it, there's different information. Because it gets updated. And then also, like, different stories work their way in. All that kind of stuff. Uh, Uncle Fishkeeper says, Corey, you are correct. Fish can travel as a carry-on. Only a TSA supervisor will say no. Even then, TSA knows they are good to pass through. Never put your fish or any living animal through the x-ray. Good to know. Well, my, my, well ah, tongue twister. What might happen, maybe someone listening to this works at TSA and they got an even better insight of like, yeah, maybe you see it like once a week at your job, you're working there for five years and you go, oh yeah, here, here's the things you can do to not make it be a pain in the butt for your TSA agent. And then we'd go, great, we can get that information out to everybody and we can just make life easier. I've watched the Saturday video. So Saturday, I did a video with uh, Brain Farting. What was his name? Uh, oh, gosh. I look so bad on camera when I can't remember someone's name. Harlan? Yeah, Harlan. 
so I, he interviewed me about the 800 gallon stuff and he said and this person says have you considered uh leptobotia elongata so now i google that because i don't know a fish by that latin name and then hopefully i see it and i go oh that one oh that didn't copy and paste very well this is going to be a cluster hold on i'm trying it help send help now my chat window's hidden Gosh. come on oh it's because i keep going back between i did Control C and not Command C. I'm on a I'm on a Mac right now. I gotta I have to game on a laptop. And then oh, here we go. Yeah, those Roy I, I know them as the Royal Loach. Here they're being called the Imperial Flower Loach. Those things are super cool and I've never kept them. So uh at the moment I do know I'm getting clown loaches back. I asked uh Brandon, store manager, I was like, hey, import some clown loaches, quarantine them. And I want to get a group of them. I don't know what tank I'm doing yet. Could be the 230. Could be a 125. Long term. Uh, could go into an 800 gallon setup with other loaches. Don't know where I'm headed yet. I just know need some loachness back in my life. Do I have any? Am I, I'm trying to think. Am I messing up my job? Do I have anything I'm supposed to be promoting right now? Um... New products, not so much right now. I am supposed to tell you to buy all of it. You should become members. Make sure you link up your account. Save 5% on everything you buy from us. Um, you know, I think over half of the RPP stores also take that discount. Buy from our RPP stores. That helps. Mm, we got the tissue cultures. Those are new. I'm working on updating pictures and stuff on the website, but that's kind of going slow at the moment. Hmm. What's my next African fish I really want to get? Uh, if everything goes right, Bob will be dropping me off some Cyprochromus leptosoma uh, blue neons tomorrow. So that would be the next African fish. A Lake Tanganyikan fish. And uh, he was down at the, the wet spot wholesale and uh, retail store. And he was digging around there. And uh, he, he knew I was on the lookout for some colorful Cyprochromus because mine still have not colored up. And I said, uh, yeah, if you see any leptosomas of the blue variety, I'm into that. And he eventually found some, and I was like, okay, well, how about you give me some of these? So how do I become a member? There should be a little button that says join after you've, you've subscribed, right? So subscribing means our videos will show up more in your feed. The join button means you can give us $5 a month, and uh, you get no benefit. No, actually, you get... We hire a speaker every month to do a talk. There's extra videos. You get a discount on our website when you link the two. Uh, and probably some other perks that I'm, I'm bad at uh, explaining. We take all that money. We try to do good things uh, with it, whether it's launch a new product we think people need or do an event or like when we did the event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we don't charge them. We just show up. We pay for the plane tickets. We, we gave away stuff. Everything we gave away, we paid for. He did pay for the shipping on getting the bags there, so it wasn't without him having an investment as well. But, you know, in general, we try to, uh, you know, give give back to the community. Community gives us, we give back. We try to. Whatever became of the camping mug, it's still, uh, I don't know which container it's going to land on, but I think it's ready to, like, one of the containers is going to show up, so that product's on the way. I don't know which container, though. Uh, let's see, from the TSA website, live fish in water in a clear, transparent container are allowed after inspection by a TSA officer. Final decision rests with the TSA officer on whether the item is allowed. I also believe the pilot has a final say also. I've never heard of any pilot saying no, but I, I think also they could chime in and go, mm -mm, nope, no fish on this one. Because they're responsible for, uh the safety of everybody on the plane. So I think they get kind of a final say on some of that stuff. Anything out of the ordinary, like, mm, nope, that ain't happening. Shout out to Candy for helping me with my order last week. UPS said my entire order was dropped off, but only one thing was. Yep, overstressed shipping systems throughout the country are going to cause lots of stuff like that. If anything goes too wrong, we always make it right, and uh, our customer service are top-notch. Candy runs the whole team of them there, and uh, we continually update internal wikis and change processes and document data all of that stuff in a goal to make everything better whether 
it's just for us, other stores, our manufacturers, you know, so when you have a problem, we document it and we take that, we take the percentages and we go to the manufacturer to try to make a product better. If people are having problems with our website or something else, we go, okay, well, how many? Let's, let's try to attack that. And that's Candy's job to surface that stuff up towards, you know, kind of keeps escalating through like, oh, this person can solve that for us. Great. No worries. Like, oh, we need an update to the website about a product. Irene can do that, for instance, or Candy can do that. Uh, but then if it's like, oh, this is a thing that needs to get changed on the product packaging, like that might be Randy and Lizzie. And then, oh, this is a thing that's even a higher question that might get to me. Um, not that like I wouldn't weigh in on it. It's just there's when you've got 35 people kind of funneling stuff every day, there's like, oh, there's seven new things for me to like weigh in on. And we try not to make it be 46, right? If each decision takes 10 minutes, like that's 460 minutes. Divide that by 60 minutes, you're like, wait, that's like several hours worth of thinking. And there's also decision fatigue. You get worse at making decisions the more decisions you're making over and over and over again. And so the goal would be uh, take Corey's fickle brain, keep it at max capacity to hopefully make something better and not worse. That's that's the goal. Uh, let's see here. Is it possible to selectively breed female guppies like Vienna to have more color? Yes. Uh, I'm working on that with my colony and basically what I do is I take females and males that I don't like and I sell them at the store. It's not that they're bad. I'm selecting, I want mine a little more deeper orange. I want the females a little bigger. Uh, I like certain tail shapes and I colony breed. So I just keep pulling out the ones that don't fit what I like. And eventually the colony over the years morphs more and more to what I like to look at. If I were on a budget, would I go with Hikari or Extreme? I'm eyeballing the Extreme, the nice slow sinking pellets, but I've, I'm used to Hikari. Uh, this is only going to, you know, make one of those two companies that like to work with us sad. <laughs> so I'm in that position. But I will always remain true to the hobbyist first. If I was on a limited budget, I personally would choose the Hikari. Because I get more food for my money. There are more fillers, I believe, in Hikari Foods. I still believe they're a good food. And I believe they've been making fish food for so long. I keep telling my team this. There is something magical about like the Hikari Algae Wafer and a couple other that are products where I'm like... The, the response to a, a Hikari Algae Wafer is disproportionate to what you read on the package. You're just like, but... They should not be losing their minds over this. I don't get it. Because we're still trying to develop our own fish foods. And so I'm looking at it going, we could have the same ingredients, but we don't get that response. And so, you know, we've explained, you know, types of fish meals and all that kind of stuff in the past. But if if I was on a tight budget, I would buy Hikari. Uh, I also would probably splurge once in a while and get extreme. You know, if I had a little bit extra money just to mix it up a little bit. But I will always be in the camp of I'm trying to – my goal is always to get maximum value for you. Even when I have an expensive product. Like my my uh, my whole thing about my lights, for instance, they're expensive, but they're going to work for a very long time. They take a beating. They can get wet and splash and all that and not die instantly. And so the value – it's not that I – I don't think – some cheap products are very have great value. Some expensive products have great value. Some things that are in the middle have terrible value. And so I'm always trying to maximize value. Like a, a linear air piston pump, for instance, very expensive for your fish room. The value, though, when it doesn't break down for 25 years straight, is off the charts. Now, when you come to me and go, like, I got a $50 budget. How do I get air in my fish room? I go, great, we're going to buy some cheaper air pumps because the bigger thing is not an option. But if you come to me and you go, I got, I got a budget, what would you buy? I go, there's no question. You buy the thing that's never going to break, for sure. Yeah. For some reason, my bottom dwellers prefer Hikari pellets more than the extreme wafers. I feed both in my fish room, truth be told. Mine seem to react pretty, like, pretty much the same. They'll, well, not they don't react the same. They eat the same. Like, they just chow down on it. But she's more of a feeding frenzy on the algae wafer, like more excitedness. So, 
I, I, but I, when you look at the ingredients, there's, there's not something that sticks out of like this, you know, like this is the, the chocolate cake and that's what they're going nuts for. You're just like, I don't know. They, they kind of, but there's something in that. They got some magic, some magic. Yeah, I've dropped my aquarium co-op light many times into the tank and it's never broke. So I honestly think the way to promote, I was talking with Dean about this and I, I think I'm going to do it. I honestly think the way to promote the aquarium co-op light is not the specs, not the price. It's all about build quality. And I just keep making ridiculous videos that beat on that light. And just keep telling you guys like, look, the light I think is appropriate price for how good it is and how long it's going to last you, a three-year warranty. And I can beat on this thing all day. I can make it do this. I can do all this. Don't try this at home type of stuff. And more and more people will share it if I make it funny enough. And my whole goal, honestly, it's not that I'm the best light designer that's ever existed. It's not that I'm the best sponge filter designer, any of this. I'm not. It's that I use the product every day. I know what I didn't like about other products. I feel like I can make it better for myself. And a lot of you people are like me. And I know I won't leave you high and dry. I know that I won't make you send it back to us to get a refund. I know I won't rake you over the coals to make it right. I know that I've instructed Candy and the entire team, once they prove it doesn't work right, make it as painless as possible. Priority that light, priority that heater, priority that anything, that plant, back to them. They entrusted us with giving their money. They have expectations. Those expectations have been failed. We need to make it as right as possible. <coughs> And I don't find that that happens with other manufacturers. They get uh, customer service teams that change. They have policy changes. They have underhanded ways. Like I don't like how CJ will give you a five-year warranty if you sign up and give them all their info and do all this. But if you uh, don't do that, you only get a three-year warranty. Why do we got to play the games? Why can't it be you handed me money, I hand you the best product that I can make, and if it doesn't live up to what I said it was going to do, I make it right. How is that not how commerce is supposed to work? But I have to compete with like, well, over here, company 2964Q-7 on Amazon that we've never heard of before will sell me a three-foot light for $36. And I buy these lights and I test them and I'm like, this one, like the wire's coming out. It's chintzy plastic. It's getting too hot. Like, I, I, I won't make a light like that because... I don't think that's what's right for the environment or the customer or the value. I'm trying to make a product that lasts a long time. That's always my goal. I'm trying to do like the biggest complaint is a spectrum. I like a more natural spectrum. So does Dean. So there's a lot of people in my company. There's people in my company too that like more blue. I get it. That's the biggest gripe. The other gripe's price, right? But I can't offer the if something goes wrong we make it right and we priority it back to you like the, if if our light goes wrong right something happens i don't know in the three years something happens just the light itself to ship it is 42 dollars. not even the light like just the shipping is 42 bucks so when you buy a light from us 42 of those dollars is the shipping it's crazy so then when something goes wrong that's another 42 bucks plus we got to have the cost of the light so that's how we get to like, well, why is your light going to cost money? Like to make it right and make one that is durable, that's what it's going to cost. Now, if you want a light that's cheap, Amazon's got a billion of them. And when they crap out in seven months, take your chance with the company. I hear Hyger's doing a good job. I like to hear that. You know, I like that more aquatic companies, it means that I'm having an impact. When we make it right, other companies are forced to make it right. We've been on the other side. Dean was telling me yesterday about another heater company on how eventually I kept sending him so many that had broken uh, and he knew they wouldn't give him his money back, but he doesn't want any more of those heaters either. And they were very expensive. They were $90 heaters each and they killed a whole colony of zebra plecos and all that. And, uh, you know, I, I just think, I, I, I think we're entering into a contract every time we sell something. You hand me money, I'm going to sell you this easy green. This easy green arrives and it leaked all over the place. Guess what? I've sent you more easy green. This is how it goes. And not make it like, well, you're going to have to submit a claim, actually. Uh, when something gets stolen off your porch, we don't have to, but we just send you more. 
there are companies that will make you like, well, until you have a police report, we're not sending it again. Like they will put any barrier. So you're just like, well, I'm not going to do a whole police report over $26 for the stuff. But I also feel like the store or us, we shouldn't put you through that. It's only $26 and not that much stuff is getting stolen. So I, I don't know. I have different views and I think long-term we will win this race because we're competing against ourselves. Can we make the experience better? Can we make your expectations be met? Can we make the product description better? Can we educate you better so that when you buy it, it's exactly what you thought you were buying and not so much, I didn't expect that. And so when we see that, we go, how can we change it? How can we make it, how can we do a better job? That's, we go, yep, we're gonna make it right. And then action items. How do we prevent that from happening again? How do we prevent people from putting the air pump into the water, expecting it to make air? Well, we need to put a disclaimer. Don't put in water. Needs to be external and pump air in. That's that's our education. That's our job. So, uh, speaking of exceeding expectations, I am only using the air stone from the Easy Flow Kit. I'm amazed at how effective it is. Yeah, like just the air collar thing. Yeah. Uh, I had to do the police report step with an airline that was vandalized by, wait, that vandalized my baggage. Yeah, I, it, I just, I'm trying to think of another instance where businesses, the more roadblocks you can put in before a claim is made, the more money you just save. But that's not the right action. The right action is put in the claim, fix the claim with the customer, the action needs to be, let's prevent claims from happening. What went wrong? Do we have a baggage handler vandalizing stuff? Do we have a machine tearing stuff up? Do we have a gap in our process? You, we root source it. Everything you'll ever order is on a video camera. Every packing station, every item that goes into a box, it gets recorded. And when a problem arises, we can look back and go, what did it look like before it was packed? So we can see it left the warehouse in this state. So now we know it either happened at a customer's house or it happened on the way to a customer's house. Or we can see, look, yeah, from the get-go, that was a problem. That is totally on us. Let's make sure that can never happen in our warehouse again. And so this is how we get, and don't get me wrong, working for us, there are days where you're like, this is insane. These people have lost their minds. But we're doing it so that you, our team never has to deal with it 10 years down the road. Like, we solved that. That doesn't exist in our company anymore. That can't happen. If everyone follows the rules, that can't happen. What's my dosing schedule with Easy Green and a heavily planted tank with CO2? I'm lazy AF, so I basically dose once to twice a week when I think about it. So I basically go, ah, it's Thursday today? Dosing all the tanks. And then when I go to like, ooh, I'm injecting CO2 this one? Like, yeah, lots more. Lots more CO2. Or not CO2, lots more fertilizer. And that's just how I've always done it. It's worked out well for me. What's my favorite fish to breed? Gotta, well, they're, I, depending on what I want to talk about, but I love, I love live bears. Live bears with time just make more. I feed them. I love them. They make more. And then I go, oh, I got little babies. And then I go, oh, I, they grew up and I made more little babies. What do I think about hydrolites? I think that uh, they are one of our best competitors and meaning that they are, are, some of them are viable, but on any given day, like I, I, I play this test all the time when, when uh Higer comes up. So I go to Amazon and I type in Higer light, Higer aquarium light. And then I start counting and I go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. We're starting to mix in a lot of aquanites and other stuff. So on the first page of, oh, 21. On the first page of Amazon, when I searched it, I found 21 different Higer lights. And here is always my counterpoint. I find myself to be pretty decent at my job. And I put everything I've got into the aquarium co-op light. I could not even imagine trying to track 21 different lights, defect rates, what goes wrong, 
how to improve them, how to make it better. I just don't think that's plausible for any company to do 21 of the same product. And in my opinion, their model is, let's bring all the lights in. And you can be the guinea pigs. Whichever ones are bad, we'll refund their money. It's fine. We'll just stop bringing them in. But when you, as a new hobbyist, you go to Amazon, you're like, hide your light. People say they're good. Okay. I'm going to choose... I'm going to choose option 11. Well, what if option 11 is a terrible one? You've wasted your time and money. What if it's the best one, right? And so at Aquarian Co-op, my goal is when you arrive to our website and you go, well, I want to buy a light. We have one. You know how many options? No, we, we, like, I think it's my job to be your personal shopper. Based on everything I've tested, I've got new Phoenix lights out there. I've got new this, I've got new that. I buy lights, I test, and I go, do I still think we are providing good value. Did anyone invent anything that we're missing out on? No. Uh, like one of them, light's pretty good. The remote control is a train wreck. I said, Dean, go turn that light on. It literally took him over a minute. He was like, ah. It's like, we checked, he checked if it was plugged in three times and eventually, wait, you got to press these two buttons to turn it on? I go, yeah. Is that not the worst design system ever? It's like, wow. So that's my thing is, you can be the guinea pig. You can save some money, but realize you're buying. Well, I can't know this, but in my opinion, what you're buying, it took me five years to launch my light. I could have easily go, hey, we're going to sell 10 different lights and we'll let nine out of 10 of those lights phase out and all those people will be getting burned. Or I could do my job and I'm testing all these lights and trying all these things and working with the manufacturer going, I like you as a manufacturer. I want to make it better. Here's the upgrades I want. I want a longer cord. I want better LEDs. I want to run cooler. I want a thicker housing. I want a different color. I want this. I want thicker boxes when we ship it. I want insulation when we ship it. I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. And then you guys pay me to do that. So as long as you're willing, just like you know, someone else was asking about heaters, I'm like, as long as you're willing to buy at least 10 of a product and you do a lot of testing and you test it for a year or two, you can find which of those 21 Hyger lights is the best. But too many people, they go on there and like, well, this one's got 1,500 good reviews. And it's like, that light didn't exist four months ago. And we know on Amazon, lots of people get offered gift cards to leave a review. They also, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have been reading about this, but lots of bad reviews just get scrubbed off of Amazon. Amazon goes, ah, I don't think that's a legitimate review. Because they don't get anything when products have bad ratings. So, you know, our process, open book, any, any review left on a product or our store under three, so that's a two or a one star, Candy or someone from customer service will reach out and they go, hey, what's going on? Can we make this right? And about half the time, yes. They go, oh, well, my plan arrived frozen. And be like, oh, well, did you email us? No, I didn't. Like, well, can we send you another one? They go, well, yeah, that'd be great. And we go, great. We don't even ask them to update the review. That review will just stand if that's what they wanted to do, right? Uh, and then some of them are like, no, I think your thing sucks and everybody needs to know it's a two-star. And we go, okay, we just wanted to make sure. Because about 10% of the time, people will leave a one-star thinking it's a five-star. And they go, oh, no, I didn't, mean to mean, I didn't mean to say it sucks. It's good. Like, oh, okay. Well, just so you know, one-star would be bad, five would be good. And then they usually fix it. Uh, and so the only time we don't publish reviews, and you can see that on our website. If you go to our website, by the way, we get awards for this. So let me, if you go to our homepage, aquariumcoop.com, and you scroll down, you can see that we have 71,800 verified reviews. Now, what's a verified review, you might ask? That means someone purchased the product from us and then left a review. You can leave a review without purchasing it, but that's not a verified review. We also are in the top 25 stores of this review program worldwide. We have a platinum transparency rating, which I believe when you look that up is we publish over 99% of all reviews. And then we also have the gold authenticity rating, which is I think 98% of all reviews uh, are published, which I realize there's a slight difference between the two, I don't remember. But the only ones we don't publish would be links to, you know, inappropriate stuff, swearing, right? 
derogatory terms, uh, stuff that's clearly just false. Like it's it's a product review on a banana plant, and they're like, caught my house on fire. Like it's a plant that that, that, that can't be right. Uh, and it's it's very hard, and we train our staff a lot because they like to defend the company a lot. And I believe so. Even though we have seventy one thousand plus reviews. We have 1,087 one-star reviews, right? So that, what is that? That's probably like one and a half-ish percent. I believe that because we publish those, you will also believe that we have 67,000 five-star reviews and 3,000 four-star reviews. Now, when you go to some of our competitor websites, huh, you guys never gotten a, a, a review under five, huh? They have the option of just not publishing them. They also don't have all the awards we get. So back to the Higher Light, Amazon has learned if products get too many bad reviews, they stop selling, they stop making money. And so it's becoming harder and harder for legitimate people having a bad experience to leave a review and have it be seen in Amazon. And I think that is a terrible thing to have happen in a system. That's the first stage of corrupting the whole thing. If you can't trust other human reviews, well, now it's just the wild west out there. And so I just, I, that's why I'm hypercritical of our review system. It needs to be transparent. We need to take our licks when they're deserved. Like we did, we, we really screwed that up. Yep. We totally deserve that one star review. Let's make it up by making another 500 people happy and giving us five star reviews, right? That's, that's the way I look at it. Let's not hide what we've done wrong. Let's double down on doing things right. And eventually it'll show at scale, right? Everybody's had a bad day before. Every business screwed up before. At scale, though, we want to see that we're doing things right most of the time. Because no one's going to do it right every single time, every day, every holiday. And we even leave the reviews where it's like, you guys so bad, took so long to get to me. It's like, and we look it up, left our warehouse within an hour. We paid priority shipping for it. It got lost. That's like, all right. We don't fight them on it. We just go, well, unfortunately, one of our shipping partners has let us down. That's unfortunate. It was still, we still believe the contract was you paid us. You wanted to get it fast. We said we'd get there as fast as we can. We tried our hardest. That's how it's going to be. All right. Yeah, reviews are also bought over there, both good and bad. Yeah, you can, there's lots of services that you can hire and lots of e-commerce companies do this. You can hire them to buy and leave reviews of your product on Amazon, your own website, so then they can be verified. You just go like, here's $100, buy this $20 product, you keep 80, write the review, AI will do it. You can also buy a package of, yeah, I wanna spend this money, I want you to buy the stuff from my competitor website and leave them bad reviews. It's a terrible system. Uh, but I remain committed to transparency as much as possible. Rarely do I allow us outside of derogatory terms, swearing, lying, not a, not applicable to that product. Rarely do I allow us to not publish it. My, my mantra is if that happened to that customer, they have all the rights to leave that review. Yes, we can totally reach out to them and ask them how it went wrong, collect more information and make it right. And if they choose to update it, we love that, but don't ask them, don't bully them, don't bribe them, don't, like I was even on the fence, technically if you leave reviews, good or bad on our website, we'll give you a 5% off coupon. It follows up an email. I'm on the fence because it's like, oh, there is a reward, but it's not, like you see stuff on social media and, and companies advertise this, like, you know, if you offer a $5 gift card for everyone leaves a five-star review, you'll have lots of five-star reviews. That is that is just buying reviews. Now, if you want to offer a $5 gift card, no matter what review they leave, I don't consider that to be buying good reviews anymore. They can leave you a one-star as long as you're giving them that $5 gift card or a three-star or two-star or four-star, doesn't matter. We're giving you a discount if you've left us an appropriate review Right. Well, actually, you get the discount either way. So you could like spam us with porn links and it will automatically send you the, the discount, but it wouldn't get published. And uh, all it all it has done, it's made more people take 
the 60 seconds out of their day to go, you know what? I have been using this for a while. Like, all right, yeah. I do like my aquarium co-op sponge filter. Ding, done. And now you get 5% off your next order. Like that's, I feel like that's a win. Because so often I'm busy and it's not that I wouldn't leave a review. It's like, ah, I, I, I don't know, I'm busy, you know. And so it's it's a way to go, oh yeah, I'm placing. So normally what I have happen, what we're seeing is you get that email like, nah, I ain't doing that, no. Mm. But then like a month later, you're like, oh, I do need to order some fish food. Wait a sec. Let me leave a review. Oh, I got a discount. All right. Okie dokie. We own the rarest native fish in the USA, I believe. If I'm wrong, please correct me. It's a piebald blue catfish, 25 to 30 pounds. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think I'm educated well enough to know what would the rarest fish in the US be. That thing sounds reasonably rare, but I have nowhere, no idea on where on the scale of rareness that native would be. We've had bad reviews from the 5% discount as well. I'm sure. I'm sure there's people that leave a review going, we're trying just to buy reviews. No. we. Well, yes. I, 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 I can see that. Yes, we are. We want more people to leave reviews. Good or bad, more reviews. Because I believe that's the strongest thing. Tell people how you used it. Tell them whether you liked it or didn't like it. What you do and don't like about it. And other people. I read reviews on everything I buy. I go, ooh, yeah. Oh, I'm getting pretty bad reviews. Then I go, oh, this. This guy's using it exactly how I do. That's going to be amazing for me. Right? Think about shoes and clothing and all this stuff where it's like, you just have different feet. You have different taste buds. You have different things. A bad review can still be a good, like, sometimes I read the bad reviews and I go, oh, they they thought this thing was going to do that? Of course it doesn't do that. And then you explain, like, this is exactly what I wanted to do, though. Great. The one star review sold me on it. Uh, let's see. My rebar cichlid is bullying the heck out of my Josh Denny. I feel like that is like a troll. I don't know a rebar cichlid, and I also don't know a Josh Denny. Josh Denny? Is that... Autocorrect could be playing Havoc. That could be happening. Let me let me Google Foo real quick here. Uh, Josh Denny cichlid? Mm, nope, nothing came up. And a, a, a rebar cichlid. Let me see. Uh, no, nothing came up for that either. So, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so anyway, to follow up the review thing, leave reviews on our products, both good and bad. It We, we take the data, we try to make products better. And as, as good as my tiny pea brain is, I can't test. So let's say I test on 100 tanks in my fish room for a year. That's pretty good. But in a year, we sell 40,000 sponge filters, and now 20,000 people are, are using them, and they're using them in different ways and trying things and running into things. That, that data coming back to us helps us make the product better, right? So like one of the things that I found, with a crazy strong linear air piston pump, the small sponge filter, you can get so much flow going through it that it wants to tip over. So we're gonna make uh, the base thicker and heavier to prevent that. Now, when I was testing, I was testing the easy flow on all my mediums. I didn't run into that problem. I ran into it when I installed new ones. You guys are probably running into that. And we take that kind of data and we go, hey, let's upgrade this thing. Like, we're not this giant board company that goes, we don't care. They'll eat what we serve them. Instead, we go, yeah, that's better. Let's make it better. That's amazing. Let's make it better. I just don't understand why every company is like, yeah, just make it better. You make a perfect product. Other people can't exist. That's the perfect thing for a business. So we just always, I always go, oh, we can make it better? Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Oh, I'm over time. Oh, no. The write-up on the pygmy corridora species is great. Will there be write-ups on other lineage? I don't know. We kind of wait to see how articles do over like three months. You know, how are they ranking in Google? And what is the response? And how often they're being visited afterwards? And all that. And then also, I, we try to really make it so that like, is Irene or anyone else writing an article, are you interested in it? 
Are you having fun with it? Not too dry, not getting too bored. We're trying to keep you actively engaged because when you've got a deadline of like another blog article every week, like it can get monotonous. So like what's making it less monotonous for you? Yeah, do some of that for a while. When are the heaters going to be back in stock? Never. Never will they be back in stock. We may make a new, better, improved heater someday, but the heaters as we currently sell them will never be back in stock. We took a $75,000 loss on that, learned a ton about social media and how you can crush yourself with success. And uh, next time we ever launch something like that, we will have a way better game plan. That I know. Uh, let's see here. I think the co-op sponge filter is the best on the market, just my opinion. I don't care. I, however, don't care for the pre-filter sponge as mine doesn't fit anymore and I had to add zip ties. Well, that's a fair uh, fair assessment. I do have it on my project list. I want to make some uh, intake strainers, so the part that goes on your intake, that mates up really well with our pre-filter sponges. Uh, definitely for like FX, the FX line and some other stuff. I want to, I've got, I don't want to lay out all my ideas because then sometimes I don't get around to it for like 14 months and someone steals my idea. So that, that always is disappointing, but that is on my, it's on my radar. Not the first time I've heard that sponges can lose shape over time. And I think I've got some ways to make it better, but I got to do a little bit of testing. I mean, I've been doing some testing. I want to do some more testing. I want to get some more prototypes made. And then I want to eventually find a way we can sell it at a, a completely affordable price and just make it better. I don't like the big bulky FX6 intake anyway. I always make my own out of PVC. And so I think whether you use our sponge filter, pre-filter or not, I want to be able to upgrade that. Like just, just give me some options. So uh, at the end of the day, I'm just a big fish nerd. I'm always tinkering and I'm going, yeah, let's do that someday. Let me write that down. So hopefully over time you go, hey, they solved that that grievance I had. Great, took them two years, which they'd done it faster, but hey, they did it. I eventually want to upgrade to the aquarium co-op air pump. Yeah, we're also working on another bigger air pump. You guys keep going, how how I get bigger power, and then we go, oh well, we don't really do bigger power. Let's work on that. So we try to and. We're waiting on first prototypes, and they might suck. And I go, well, let's go back to the drawing board on that. Or they might be amazing. We start testing them. So, you know, I, I remain committed. My company is baffled that I, you know, they, they're like, is this guy irrational? No company, well, I shouldn't say no. Very few companies would have been like, yep, right off 75 grand inventory. We're taking a beating. Most companies go, but if we sell it all, and only 7% have defects, don't we make a ton of money? And I go, yes, but our, our reputation is more important, and I value that. And so the thing I'm building over the next 50 years, when I'm 90, I want that reputation. I want to actually make the hobby better. I want the hobby to be strong. I want the stores, all the RPP stores, everything doing well. I want clubs to be doing well. I want fish keeping to be more popular. I want it to be loved by everybody. I want people to be more into nature. I want all of that. And I think all of that can be done and also be profitable and provide uh, a stable business. Now, if I ever go out of business, we know that wasn't achievable with my small brain. Someone else can do it. But that's how I try to navigate through. Can we be this business that we want to be, still make enough money to make our pass through? And so far, we're yet 11 years in and we've been able to pull it off. Hopefully, we got many more years of doing that. And we keep making more products. We keep trying to do better. You know, if one out of every, you know, we're up to like 50 products, I think, maybe even more than 50. And I think we've only ever had to discontinue like six. So it's it's less, well, it's a little more than 10%, but so like six of them, like our, our nets long-term will be discontinued. We're going to replace with a different net. So like that's five SKUs right there. Like that's five of the of the, you know, five things right there. And then there's the, the original auto feeder and the heater, CO2 regulator. It's probably something else I failed on. And it's not always I've failed. Sometimes it's manufacturing. Sometimes I misread what people actually wanted. Um, but yeah. So 
please do me a favor, buy all of our stuff. Spend all night long, all day long while you're at work, just buying our stuff, giving us all your money. We'll put it all into other stuff and and then tell you to buy more of our stuff. It'll be great. Uh, keep super chatting me like uh, Nat, uh, Natalie B did. Thank you so much. She says, thanks for everything. Here's $10. Well, I'll make sure that $10, I can't, I guess, I, I, I'd just be lying. Hopefully that $10 will end up supporting a school or a club or something else we're doing. But I, I'm not going to track that $10 and make sure it does that. But we will do more good things. And uh, hopefully your $10 filters that way. And, uh, you know, maybe it makes a new part that you want for your aquarium. Maybe it makes a new club. Maybe it helps a new local store. I don't know where it'll go. But we'll try to make sure it went somewhere and not completely wasted. So thanks for hanging out. I'll try and see you uh, next Sunday. I say try because I plan to. I always plan to. But uh, sometimes I get busy and things come up and uh, or my voice gives out or uh, someone's making tacos and I got to eat. You know, real life stuff happens sometimes. Uh, I also got to visit my grandma soon. I've been not visiting her enough. I guess I did have COVID for two weeks and I don't want to give my grandma COVID. So, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, there's one more. Uh, Corey, sorry for the autocorrect. My red bar is bullying the heck out of my Josh Denny. I feel like that autocorrected Josh Denny again. Uh, but post it on the forum. Other people will help. And uh, I think it could have been that red T-bar cichlid that Candy was mentioning and possibly a Jack Dempsey. Uh, in general, with cichlids, if they're bullying, line of sight blocks. So big fake plastic plants or big pieces of wood, they are allowed to take over territories. So if, uh, if I had three, you know, three kids in here and they're going, hey, they're on my side. That's not fair. Put up two sheets. Guess what? Now they go, hey, this is my side. Don't come to my side. And then the person in the middle, hey, this is mine. Don't you come in here. And the person over there. But when it's open, someone's trying to take over the whole room. So line of sight blocks is the way you can uh, ratchet down bullying quite a bit usually. So uh, thanks for five gifted subs from Fish Room Fever. Hopefully you're you're getting back. Uh, I, I looked the other day. You hadn't live streamed or done anything in a while. So hopefully everything's good for you. Fish Room Fever. And uh, maybe I'll see you at an event or something like that. Everybody keep being cool. Uh, don't forget to compliment somebody this week. I, I've been forgetting to say that lately, and that's that's bad on me. Uh, compliment somebody. Buy all of our stuff. Leave some reviews. Uh, teach someone the hobby. Take a look at nature. Spring right now is kind of pretty cool to look at stuff. I know Katie was outside planting different kinds of trees. We got some crazy ones. They're going to make berries to feed the burbs. And uh, we've been kind of... She's been really becoming a, a, a bird kind of kind of sewer. And I have as well. We can listen to the frogs, all that kind of stuff. It's all good stuff. You know, nature's amazing. Take it in while you can. And if you can't, drive somewhere and take it in. You know, I've, I've had to live in apartments. You look out and you're like, well, there's not much nature here. Maybe you get some bees or some bugs or, you know, put out a, a feeder. Get something, something visiting you. Maybe you got to, you know, get some trash pandas crawling up the thing because you live up in an apartment that came up from the garbage cans. You can at least feed the, the raccoons, which I know you probably shouldn't, but. I don't know. Nature blows my mind. Even when it's like, well, that thing's crazy. Look at that thing. It's playing dead. Weird. I guess it's a possum, not, not a raccoon, but same difference. Those two will go fight over cat food and stuff. We'll see you around. Have a good week. Watch all my videos. Make sure you watch Kikazoo. Check out our members only content. Check out all the videos that will be coming out uh, about uh, my fisherman stuff on Keeping Fish Simple and Harlan's channel. And uh, watch the community page. I'll, I'll be updating stuff there too. So, Thanks so much. Truly appreciative. And uh, it's dinner time now for me. It's only 7, 7.14. Bye-bye.